Yesterday we highlighted that uh, we've all evolved to optimize our capacity to sense and respond to our environment. But the challenge that we face in the 21st century is a growing evolutionary mismatch with the pace and cultural technolo technological changes that are outpacing our adaptive ability. A longstanding uh, challenge in the advancement of any field, but particularly in the fields that we've been talking about over the last day, is an ever increasing requirement for specialization, along with a need uh, for what has been termed by E.O. Wilson and others as a consilience or a jumping together of knowledge by the linking of facts and fact based theory across disciplines to create a common groundwork uh, of explanation. Pointer is not working. There's a challenge, what we learned yesterday is there's a challenge in linking uh, metabolic epigenetic interactions with gut brain interactions to predict cellular behavior. But uh, as was so nicely uh, highlighted um, by um, our speakers was that computational tools uh, provide an opportunity along with commonalities across species to help us understand these linkages across scales. The frame for our workshop uh, importantly examines opportunities and challenges in leveraging our growing understanding of the gut, microbiota, immune neurological axis. Uh, Bioelectronic uh, medicine, we learned yesterday, uh, has spanned disciplines uh, over two decades of research and has led us to understand that the stimulation of the vagus nerve can attenuate uh, the severity of a variety of inflammatory disorders, including rheumatoid arthritis. And intriguingly, that specific neurons are responsive to very specific, unique inflammatory mediators. Uh, decoding these connections uh, can be a challenge, uh, but machine learning approaches uh, provide uh, new opportunities to allow us to decode these signals that have been previously considered intractable. An appreciation of readily available technologies uh, that spans multiple different disciplines from biology to engineering to computer sciences uh, are now offering uh, a significant amount of hope for patients with inflammatory bowel disease, rheumatoid arthritis, and other acute and chronic uh, inflammatory uh, diseases. We also learned that uh, uh, while behavior can be modulated by genetic or environmental factors, we now have an increasing understanding that microbes can modulate behavior independently. A variety of ser serendipitous uh, findings have led to the discovery, as was uh, highlighted yesterday by um, our speakers, uh, that lactobacillus ruteri specifically can rescue social de deficits in mouse models of autism. There have also been uh, six preclinical trials in a variety of animal models and two small uh, independent human trials but human trials nonetheless that suggest that lactobacillus ruteri is safe and that there's a potential for this new field of precision microbial intervention. With all that said, we need to understand the mechanisms that underlie the effects of bacteria on behavior if we're really to advance and optimize uh, this field. Microbes can regulate uh, the food that we eat and the neurochemicals that are generated, uh, both uh, directly by bacteria and through a variety of metabolic intermediaries uh, to protect against seizure disorders. And we learned uh, from our speakers yesterday that uh, the opportunity exists to identify specific microbes, microbial products, and nerve targets, uh, and to determine whether the applications of specific microbes can replace a variety of diet dietary interventions that have been identified um, 
for patients with seizure disorders and a variety of other ailments. Studies of Parkinson's disease have taught us that uh, motor symptoms are often preceded uh, by non-motor GI symptoms, uh, sometimes for, by many years and even decades, and that treating GI symptoms uh, have been described to affect the development of motor symptoms in Parkinson's disease that has led to the hypothesis that um, this neurological disorder might actually originate in the gut. We learned that alpha-synuclein, when misfolded, can promote neural, neuronal dysfunction. And we also learned that microglia are a potential target for prebiotics. Also, dietary interventions uh, may limit neuroinflammation uh, and potentially have an impact in either the prevention or uh, mitigating the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. I think the, the biggest challenge that we highlighted yesterday were the potential roadblocks to the translation of the biology of the gut-brain access to therapeutic interventions. Uh, the degree of personalization of microbes across different people with different genetics and different backgrounds is clearly a barrier to intervention. The development of effective medicines is ultimately guided by a fundamental understanding of the mechanisms of action of these medicines. But how do we balance the real world immediate need for therapeutic interventions for patients and families who are staring into the abyss uh, with the need to spend time and resources to understand the mechanisms required to ultimately optimize the therapeutics that we introduce? And fundamentally, somebody has to pay for all of this. And someone, some entity or organization is asking, what will be the return for this investment? And in a resource-constrained environment, we're always challenged by the question of how do we prioritize investments for effective uh, therapeutics and interventions? This research space also spans so many different fields that there are challenges to the traditional structures that have evolved in science and academia. And how can we think about building the research teams that we actually need to drive this highly interdisciplinary field forward? There's a critical need to identify talented people with varying, varying perspectives but also who bring unique technical, technical skills to bear to solve these problems. Critically, we need increased levels of conversation and communication across specialty areas to become great problem finders and problem solvers. Ultimately, we need to help trainees develop the applicable knowledge so that they can address these problems in a truly cross-disciplinary approach. And consider changing the structures to incentivize multidisciplinary teams to tackle these very uh, difficult areas. The most important question is, how can we make the greatest advances in the fields, and where do we hope to find ourselves 10 years from now? Anticipating uh, that multiple interventions may be needed to address a disorder rather than a simple monotherapeutic intervention is probably a very complex challenge uh, that needs to, uh, to be recognized and appreciated. Clearly, there is a need uh, that has um, been emphasized throughout the first day that fundamental mechanistic studies regarding deciphering how circuits in the brain and the gut work individually and together will clearly be needed uh, to accelerate uh, discovery and translation. We will also need to change our framework and our culture to expand clinical trials and particularly community-based clinical trials, all the while reducing the time um, for these trials and their cost. 
And clearly, there will be a need to choose carefully and wisely to mobilize all the resources. And there's nothing like success that generates success. And those early successes will clearly be huge motivators for the field as a whole. In the context of all this, the question is, is our regulatory environment uh, fundamentally structured to promote and accelerate these changes uh, and to accept the inherent risks and the important ethical questions uh, that will ultimately arise. All too often, uh, culture and technical change outpaces uh, the regulatory environment in which we work. I think it's been a wonderful first day of this symposium, uh, and I think we look very much forward to the outstanding speakers that we have uh, for the second day. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Kavita Berger, who will be a co-moderator with me for this very first session. And uh, Kavita, if you can come on up. And I will introduce uh, the first speaker that we have this morning, who is uh, Professor My Mark Light. Uh, Mark Light is the Eugene Lloyd Chair in Toxicology and the Professor of Veterinary Microbiology and Preventive Medicine at Iowa State. Uh, Dr. Light completed his undergraduate degree at Farley Dickinson and his master's and PhD at the Weizmann Institute of Technology. He subsequently pursued postdoctoral fellowships in immunology at the Medical College of Virginia and the University of uh, Pittsburgh. Dr. Light is uh, the recipient of the 2017 uh, Leo Bustad Distinguished Lecture Series Award and has been a pioneer in the field of microbial endocrinology that represents the union of microbiology and neurobiology uh, with a focus on identifying neurochemicals that serve as an evolutionary-based language between the host and uh, the microbiota environment uh, to enhance health and wellness and understand mechanisms of disease. Uh, Dr. Light, the virtual podium is yours. Well, thank you very much. And I want to thank the organizers for this invitation. And I want to specifically thank Dr. Trico for introducing us to evolution and mentioning evolution, because I want to really emphasize evolution throughout my talk, because evolution is telling us something. And what you see here on the screen is social conflict stress between two animals, where one animal bites another animal, and introduces into that animal an infectious insult from the bacteria in its mouth. And according to what we all always thought about stress, that this animal that is being bitten is highly stressed, is that its immunity is going to go down. And so what I want to ask you, does that make evolutionary sense for an animal's immune system when faced with an infectious insult to just say, I give up and die? Well, that's not the case. And so what we did over 30 years ago was look at this in the laboratory where we had mice fight each other under social conflict. And when we examined the stressed animal, we found that actually the innate arm of the immune system, those cells concerned with phagocytosis and destruction of infectious um, bacteria on first pass were actually increased by over 500% in activity. It was the first time that on the innate immune system in immunology was shown to be increased upon stress and that it was actually not unchangeable, it was actually changeable. So we were really excited about those results and we progressed on to give them an infection. And we gave them an oral Yersinia enterocolitic infection which causes a GI-based infection. And to our astonishment, we found that those animals which had increased immunity, as you can see here, where it says defeated, they were defeated animals, they actually died faster because they got the infection. So you were faced with a paradox. How can increased immunity of over 500% in terms of what you know, the cells that are normally concerned with phagocytosis of bacteria actually lead to increased death of these animals? So let me ask you, does this make evolutionary sense? And the question of is, for whom? Who are we talking about? We're talking about usually the host and its survival, but we also need to talk about the poor bacteria 
that was in the mouth of one of the animals and now has been introduced into the system of the other animal or the bacteria that was in the food and you ate it and now it is your gut and now has to find out what to do. So what are bacteria doing and what, what are bacteria sensing? So what I'm going to want you to consider for today is that these bacteria are recognizing neurochemicals. And neurochemicals as such are an evolutionary conserved language, an evolutionary based language of neurochemistry between the microbiota and the host. And that this is one of the ways by which the microbiota gut brain axis is going to function. So with that in mind, let me ask the question again from evolution, where are these neurochemicals? And neurochemicals are actually omnipresent in nature. So if you look at plants, I often bring up bananas because bananas in their peel have dopamine and norepinephrine, not like us dopamine-like or norepinephrine-like, it's exactly the same as the structure as what we have as animal fat. And as a banana actually browns, if you're gonna make banana bread and you leave it on your table, as that skin actually browns, it actually increases the amount of dopamine and norepinephrine in the peel. Now, back in the 50s, if this is a cardiac meeting, back in the 50s, and we were all the cardiologists were meeting, we would be telling our patients, you cannot eat bananas, because you're gonna set off a cardiac episode. And that was not changed until this was published in 1958 in Science, when to get into science in those days, all it took you to do was to peel a banana. And that's all this person did. They peeled the banana and they showed that there was a division of catecholamine between the peel and the pulp. That in the pulp of the banana, there was actually little amount of catecholamine, it was all in the peel. So then, it became okay for cardiac patients to, again, eat bananas. Other common food stuff, if there are neuro, a neurologist in the audience, they know that if you prescribe a psychoactive drug regimen, you put your uh, patient on a restricted diet so they don't eat tomatoes and other plant-based foods that have neurochemicals that may in interfere with the treatment. Now, that's neurochemicals in plants. Obviously, before they we ever as animals appeared on the planet. And that extends to potatoes in the ground. Everything has neurochemicals like we do. But what about bacteria? In bacteria, we know that probiotics have GABA. So when lactobacillus ruteri was mentioned yesterday, the first thing I was thinking of, do they know what the GABA potential in these bacteria are? Because GABA, gamma immunobutyric acid, primary neuroinhibitory transmitter in our brains, was described decades ago in lactobacilli. Lactobacilli make other types of neurochemicals such as acetylcholine. What are they doing it? Why are they making it? We really don't know the answer to that. So matastatin is found in Bacillus subtilis. The catecholamine biosynthetic pathway that animals have of L-dopa, dopamine, nor, uh, norepinephrine and epinephrine, that exact biosynthetic pathway is found in E. coli not like our pathway, the same as our pathway, but the same cofactors that are used in the catecholine biosynthetic uh, mechanism. Actually, in E. coli, also high affinity, 100% homology with the N-viral gene has been found for opioid binding sites in E. coli. So there's a lot of uh, data out there to show that there is a reason why these things are th uh, that have been there and that neurochemicals are omnipresent. So there's a common evolutionary thread here, that there's this relationship between microorganisms and the host. And in fact, that the evolution of cell-to-cell -cell signaling that we use in animals for our neurophysiological system may actually be due to late horizontal gene transfer from bacteria. There's an excellent paper by Iyer in Trends in Genetics going back now nearly 20 years that discusses this. So microorganisms in the gut, such as those that are really anywhere, skin everywhere, do not simply rely on traditional nutritive energy sources. So that's one thing I want you to, in a way, unlearn from your microbiology experience that you have to grow them in this broth culture and they need nutritive energy sources to do what they do. They actually are relying on a lot of non-nutritive energy sources uh, that to, for their survival and behavior. And this means that there is a direct interaction 
between the neurochemistry and bacteria and the host neurophysiology and that bacteria are not dumb bugs. They simply do not divide one to two, two to four, four to eight, and so on, but they are interactive and they will change their behavior and physiology based on what they sense and what they possess in the, in the community that they're around. So they're an interactive player in health and nutrition. So let me jump now to, to say what this comes together as. This comes together as the field of microbial endocrinology. So when people were talking about yesterday about that now a lot of this is accepted, you could imagine over 30 years ago when this was first proposed, what type of reticence was, was uh, greeted when the proposal was put forward that you have to join the fields of microbiology and neurobiology. That neurobiology has a reason to interact with microbiology and vice versa. And that formed back then, I put forward the proposal, the hypothesis that that forms microbial endocrinology. And that this interaction of bacteria and neurochemistry, whether the neurochemistry originates in the bacteria itself, because the neurochemicals are present in the bacteria, are they using it for community structure and regulating community structure? Just as Dr. Elaine Shaw mentioned yesterday about microbial communities, what's happening, there is a reason that they have them. But for today, we're talking about host physiology, so that this interaction between the host physiological, neurophysiological system and the bacteria means this is microbial endocrinology, and that can affect disease and behavior, the gut to brain axis, and that stress and nutrition, because you have neurochemicals in your foods, all interact in this complex interaction, and that this will ultimately affect human and animal health, and evolution is a theme throughout. So let me show you what the relevance of this is. So a number of years ago, when I was in the Department of Surgery, one of the things that I learned was, of course, one of the big problems in the surgical field was the fact that there are indwelling uh, medical device infections, and those indwelling medical devices, such as catheters, for example, that we use in patients, often get infected with Staphylococcus epidermidis. So that is the most common bacteria that will infect catheters and other indwelling medical devices. And this will, of course, cause huge issues for the patients and removal of the devices and replacement. And it was not understood why these bacteria are not normal skin bacteria would infect these devices. After, because the, obviously the point of insertion of the catheter is cleaned by the nurse, it's povidone iodine, how does this happen? So we looked into this from a microbial endocrinology standpoint. And as we published in Lancet in 2003, we finally explained over nearly half a century of not understanding why this happened, why this happened. And what you see here is a, bi is a catheter, the inside of a catheter, which we have put a medium, I won't go into now, which is reflective of what's in the patient. And we have put onto it six, four to six staph epi, very low amount, four to six clinically relevant amount. There is nothing there. There is no growth that is simply background noise. But now, if instead we subject these four to six bacteria to the same thing that is going down the tube of the catheter, what is the physician giving this surgical patient? They're giving them catecholamine inotropes to prevent low blood pressure, hypotensive uh, effects following surgery and in other medical conditions. And what we show is this, that these catecholamine inotropes will stimulate these four to six bacteria within a matter of hours to do this. They make this huge biofilm. And as you can see here, here are all the hallmarks of the biofilm on this device. So we were able to show this, that this catecholamine inotrope, which could be dobutamine, or as I learned after the first time I gave this talk at a surgical infectious disease meeting, the chief of surgery, uh, who was actually the session chair, came up to me and uh, the first question I was asked was, do you know what we call norepinephrine bitartrate that we give to patients uh, as, a, as a catecholamine intro? And I said, I don't know the name. And he said, well, it's called Le Levafed. And then he asked me, what, do you know what the nickname for Levafed is? And I said, no. And he says, well, give them Levafed, leave them dead. And is this an explanation of why patients may develop sepsis afterwards and stimulation of low amounts of bacteria? And as you can see here, 
The answer is yes, because there is a powerful stimulant and this is not nutritive. This is micromolar amounts of a catecholamine can do this to Staph epi. Since then, a number of labs have, have repeated that and the rest, so I won't go into that, into a number of organisms, E. coli, salmonella, which are similarly can be affected and, and change your bacteria physiology. But what we wanted to do then was to ask the question of, well, if that worked for infection, what about the microbiome gut-brain axis? Can the brain actually see what's in the gut? And as you see here in the title, I say the modern era demonstration of the axis, because as I will touch on briefly a little later, this microbiome gut-brain axis, although we assume it's rather new in how we're describing it, goes back to the 1910s, over a hundred years, people were doing the same things that we're doing now in terms of study. If you talk about lactobacillus giving to patients with neurological issues, they were doing that in 1914 and using some of the same bacteria we're using now. We need to be aware of that literature. So back in 1998, we gave CGG9 to mice as a novel bacterium that did not induce an immune reactivation. Obviously, Campylobacter in humans is an infectious agent, but in mice it's not. It just simply passes through the system, replicates, but doesn't cause immune activation. And when we did this, we found out that it actually was, it gave an induced anxiety-like behavior in animals, which we gave it to, something was going on. And a few years later, when we actually sectioned the brain and did double-blind studies on this, we found that we were able to show that here is CFOS activation, you see here by the black dot, that you actually activated centers in the brain following this, uh, these bacteria, these novel replicating bacteria going through the gut. And that if you did a vagotomy of these animals, you completely ab ablated this result. You cut out all of the gut to brain axis that was going on. So there is neurochemical potential and responsivity within the microbiome. And that studies which have shown the ability of the microbiota to produce a wide range of neurochemicals. So if you go in the literature, you will see that the microbiota can produce an enormous plethora of neurochemicals. And again, I want to emphasize these are not simply like ours, but exactly the same in structure. And that human microbiome studies, what I've found fascinating, have shown that after antibiotics, the drug class that most influences the microbial diversity in the gut are the antipsychotics, which to the authors of the paper in Nature a few years back was quite a surprise that antipsychotics would influence the microbiome. What we did, and when we began looking at this, was to ask the question that we, we chose a model system to say, if we look at fluoxetine, which is many of you know is an, an SSRI and is one of the most prescribed antidepressants, we chose to follow up on that in a way by using fluoxetine and saying, can bacteria recognize fluoxetine and do they have receptors for this? And one of the reasons is because the use of fluoxetine in clinical practice often leads to patient noncompliance because they have tremendous shifts in their weight and they don't like having that, so they stop using the drug. So what we were able to show in 2018 was that bacteria actually possess biogenic amine transporters, the plasma membrane monoamine transporter and the organic cation transporter that are involved with SSRIs in mammalian cells in its mode of action. And that these transporter-like ones that were present in bacteria actually were more active than what they were on mammalian cells. And they were most found in lactobacilli, were most responsive to this. And when we did subsequent in vivo dosing of mice with fluoxetine, we were able to demonstrate dramatic shifts in the microbial microbial diversity, and that lactobacilli were the most affected of these organisms, of the microbiota that was there, and that was concomitant to the behavioral alterations, such as an induction of anxiogenic-like behavior. So there was a microbial endocrinology demonstration here. We don't know what the function of these biogenic amine transporters on our own lactobacilli, but they are there and they interact with the drugs that we're given, which speaks to what was discussed yesterday about the effects of drugs on the patients and how do they work. 
So taken as a whole, it strongly suggests that in-depth focused studies on the neurochemical potential of the microbiome to influence the gut-brain axis are really warranted in the future. And so I'll finish up by saying, where will we come from? So as I mentioned before, when I said the modern gut-brain axis, the emergence of the microbiome and the mi microbiotic gut-brain axis goes back at least to the 1910s, where they were using the same probiotics that we use now for identical purposes. There's an excellent article by Stowe in the Journal of Medicine and Surgery of 1914, where he concludes that the use of lactobacilli should remain on the battleground forever to prevent what he called then melancholia and other, and other neurological issues. There are other studies where they basically, before there was an IRB, they gave patients whole broth cultures of lactose and other bacteria to drink and see if it could change their uh, behavioral states. Many of these probiotics, as I said, produce neurochemicals. So there is a huge knowledge base today that lacks information concerning the capacity of microbes to make neurochemicals. And if that's one of the challenges we discussed today, I want to emphasize that to the audience, to say our databases that we utilize to do machine learning and all our bioinformatic pipelines, we have to look at our databases and say, are they complete? Have they been curated? Do they tell us what they think they tell us? And for example, no database could have predicted that Enterococcus fecium makes dopamine. So the common bug in our gut, Enterococcus fecium, can convert L-DOPA to dopamine with nearly 100% efficiency. We described that discovery back in 2018 and again, it could not be predicted from the databases. But there are huge bioinformatic issues with the databases. And I put up here Lasso versus BioBakery. For those who don't know, those are bioinformatic pipelines to use uh, predict uh, function in the microbiome. And I was on a conference call with collaborators concerning this where they said they were going to um, use Lasso. And I said, well, why not BioBakery? And their answer to me was, well, Lasso gives us significant results. And I said, are you telling me that if you put the same exact date in these different pipelines, which I kind of already knew the answer, you're going to get different answers? And the answer is, of course, yes. And the thing is, we have to stop searching for the magical p-value of less than 0.05 and start to ask, why don't our bioinformatic pipelines give us the same answers? And we need to resolve that issue, which is a big issue, I think, in the community. Which brings up one of my final points, which is there is a need for what I call old school microbiology. We have to get back to growing our bugs in the lab and seeing what they do and not try to predict what they are going to do and use nutritionally relevant media. What I mean by that is we almost all of our database information now comes from bacteria that are grown in microbiological rich media, I mean, Luria broth, LB broth, BHI, brain heart infusion broth, MRS medium for lactose. These are nutritionally rich. These are media which are bacteria are going to stay planktonic. They're not going to grow as biofilms in these medias because you're shaking them in a fermenter at high speed. You're growing them. That's not the way they act when they are face with nutritionally relevant media. What I mean that, if you're gonna eat food for what you eat at lunch and at breakfast, is not what you give the bacteria. When you give them food that we eat and make a medium approach in your lab that is constructed of the food that you actually eat, that you or your animal eat, you will get completely different results on what your bacteria are going to do. So if your bioinformatic databases are constructed of results, from microbiology rich medias that don't reflect what's actually in the gut, how do you know what you have? And our discovery of dopamine back in 2018 was made in was made in nutritionally relevant media where we actually took animal food, we ground it down and made media out of it by passing it through phases such as the mouth, the stomach, and the small intestinal fate. And we made a media uh, very much like what the pharmacological community does to test drug stability. So I think we need to get back to that old school microbiology.
And let me finish by saying to keep in mind that microbial endocrinology is an evolutionary based framework linking the components of the microbiota, host and nutrition, which, which we can interrogate the mechanisms by which the microbiome and gut brain axis influences health and disease. It is a common evolutionary language by which all elements can interact. And regarding the industry and our translational approaches we're discussing today, you can actually adopt this to the design of probiotics by asking, what is the inflammatory condition we're addressing in the gut? What do we know about it? What are the neurochemicals that affect that axis, such as dopamine and inflammation or other conditions? And so can you design your probiotics that way? And this has been done actually now, and we're, we're doing studies now with this in animals. So I'm in vet school and we like working with pigs and all the rest, which obviously their GI tract is more like humans. It's been done with the discovery of dopamine producing probiotics. So we're putting this into action now by doing this directed mechanistic approach. And I'll finish up by finally, by saying this. It's fully recognized that microbial endocrinology is only one of the possible, and I'll accentuate that, possible mechanisms that, that can affect the microbiome gut-brain axis. And there is a vast array of other possibilities that exist and need to be explored and that we are discussing at this meeting. So with that, I'll finish and th again, thank uh, the committee for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Light. Um, with your indulgence, if you wouldn't mind staying on, we're going to go through our, our speakers and then open it up for questions we'll do. Uh, and comments. So our, our next speaker is um, Melody Zhang, um, and uh, she is an associate assistant professor of immunology in the uh, Drickier Institute of Children's Health and the Department of Pediatrics at the Well Cornell Medical College. Her laboratory focuses on the crosstalk between immune cells and gut mic gut bacteria that underlie immune regulation in the brain, placenta, and lung during early development. Please. Hi, I'm just waiting for the slide. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first, uh, thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to introduce our research here today. It's been a wonderful, enlightening workshop, especially for me as an immunologist to learn about all the exciting work going on uh, on the uh, gut-brain axis. Um, let's see if I can advance. All right. Um, so the research in my labs really focus on elucidating the role of the gut microbiome in uh, facilitating the immune system developments in early life. And uh, within this context, the maternal gut microbiome is a really critical factor. Um, we know the mom's gut bacteria can shape the composition of the nutrients in breast milk. And uh, at the same time, some bacterial metabolites from the mom can be transferred to the fetus in utero during early development, and that can impact uh, immune imprinting uh, in utero. Um, at, right after birth, the uh, mom's gut bacteria can be transferred vertically to the newborn, and that really seeds the early colonizers of the bacterial um, uh, microbes in the uh, newborn's intestine that uh, can have a very long-lasting impact on the in, immune system developments in the newborn, as well as neural developments, and that collectively can have a uh, huge influence on the susceptibility to pediatric diseases, including asthma, uh, obesity, as well as some neurodevelopmental disorders such as autism, which uh, uh, was described by some of the talks from yesterday. So within the gut environment, uh, the gut commensal bacteria are actually com compartmentalized within the gut lumen. Uh, this is really uh, under the control by multiple uh, barriers to really keep the gut bacteria in check. Uh, we have a uh, variety of immune cells in the laminopropia uh, that really uh, are very critical to keep the gut bacteria in check. Uh, in particular, uh, IgA uh, antibodies to gut bacteria. 
uh, has been well studied. We know IgA can uh, transcytose to, to the um, to the uh, lumen of the intestine where uh, it can target the invading bacteria and really prevent the uh, invading bacteria from crossing the gut uh, epithelial barrier. Uh, at the time when I was a postdoc at the University of Michigan, it was still relatively unknown whether under, under homeostatic conditions that if there would be systemic IgG response to the gut bacteria. And what my work demonstrated was that uh, under homeostatic conditions, there might be some small number of gram-positive bacteria that somehow are able to bypass the gut barrier and able to induce systemic IgG response. So we do see circulating IgG in uh, naive mice and humans. And the IgG antibodies uh, can uh, respond very, very quickly when there's translocation of some gut bacteria into the bloodstream. Uh, as well as uh, bacterial pathogens such as Salmonella, which shares some of the uh, IgG conserved uh, antigens with our gut commensal uh, bacteria. And this might be a very important mechanism to really uh, facilitating very quick removal of uh, commensal bacteria in the bloodstream or pathogens during the acute phase of immune response. And this may be also an important mechanism to really maintain the symbiosis between the gut bacteria and the host. Um, so when I started my lab in 2019, uh, we uh, generated an IgG deficient mouse model in our lab. And uh, to really further explore the role of IgG or IgG gut microbiome interplay in a variety of uh, diseases, including inflammatory diseases and infection. So what we found was that when uh, there's a lack of uh, commensal specific IgG in the mom, now we see alterations in the uh, gut microbiome in the neonatal mice, in both the colon and the small intestine. And this appears to drive the uh, IL-17 cells in the intestines of the IgG knockout newborn uh, just 14 days after birth. We know this was driven by the alterations of the gut bacteria in the IgG knockout newborn because now when we redirect the IgG knockout germ-free, we no longer see the uh, increased IL-17 cells in the intestines of the IgG knockout neonatal mice. And uh, to take it one step further, we asked whether the gut bacteria specific IgG may play a role in regulating the maternal immune response to the fetus during uh, in utero development. So here we're looking at the uh, placenter at E16.5 during the third trimester of pregnancy. We're actually seeing increased numbers of the uh, IL-17 producing cells in the IgG knockout placenters, uh, particularly the cells were uh, gamma delta T cells compared to the uh, cells from the wild type placenter. And to really ask what's really driving the IL-17 cells in the IgG knockout placenter, because now we're really looking at a site that's distant from the intestine. So to figure that out, we took a step back to really understand what's going on in the intestine during pregnancy. So we see that pregnancy can actually induce uh, increased gut barrier defects and uh, increasing the gut leakiness. And that's really associated with drastic changes in the gut microbiome in pregnant mice uh, during E1005, so just the middle of the uh, pregnancy, basically. Um, interestingly, we saw an overbloom of uh, Fucarobacterium rodentium in the wild type mice. So normally in non-pregnant mice, these bacteria are very, very rare, low abundant, but you can see it uh, blooms pretty drastically during pregnancy, and then it comes back to uh, the pre-pregnancy level when we measure at just P4, uh, four, uh, four days after pregnancy. And uh, interestingly, when we took the uh, amniotic fluids from IgG knockout mice, and we were actually able to 
detect some of the carabacterium rodentium in the IgG knockout amniotic fluid, but that's not the case when we measure the amniotic fluids from wild-type mice or germ-free wild-type mice. So this really suggests that maybe the homeostatic IgG that are specific for gut bacteria may be critical to really restrict the translocation of the of carabacterium rodentium to the uh, presenter. And when you are lacking the IgG now, that may allow more for carabacterium rodentium to either translocate or, it, or somehow the DNA of that bacterium somehow made it there. And that could be a driver of the increased uh, IL-17 cells that we saw in the IgG knockout presenter. We were interested in IL-17 or maternal IL-17 during pregnancy. And there's actually a lot of attention now on maternal IL-17 during pregnancy, in part due to some seminal studies from the past few years, including this one that's shown here uh, from uh, Jun He and Grace Choi's lab. So here they did uh, a mouse model of maternal immune activation using poly IC uh, injections to make, make viral infection in pregnant mice. Uh, they showed that that could actually lead to increased TH17 cells in the pregnant mice and, and the increased maternal IL-17 signaling to the fetal brain can actually uh, trigger deficits in neural development. And, and as a result, they saw uh, behavioral deficits in the offspring. So that's really interesting. And the study really underlined the critical role for maternal IL-17 during pregnancy and some possible link to uh, impaired neural development in the fetus uh, in, in utero. Uh, so we do have evidence of increased uh, IL-17 signaling to the uh, fetal brain of IgG knockout uh, uh, fetus. So we, we see an increased IL-17 receptor expression in the IgG knockout fetus. Uh, the fetal brains, and as uh, as well as uh, an increase in IL-6. IL-6 is a no uh, key cytokine to uh, induce the differentiation of uh, TH17 cells. So so far, we we do have evidence suggesting there might be increased IL-17 signaling to the IgG uh, fetal brain, and, and possibly coming from the mom. But obviously, we have a lot more work to do to really demonstrate that. So. This is where we are this, with this project. We're really seeing a role for the gut uh, uh, bacteria-specific IgG in regulating the immune response during pregnancy at the maternal fetal interface. And uh, lacking the, the IgG may allow some commensal bacteria somehow to translocate to the placenta and possibly driving IL-17 signaling in the mom. And, and that may have some impact on the fetal brain. Um, obviously, I'm not a neuroscientist, so in order to explore more about the impact of that on the IgG knockout fetal brain, uh, luckily, recently, I just hired a uh, neuroscientist postdoc. Hopefully, he'll uh, take on the project in exciting directions, so we'll see how the project's taking us in the next few months. Um, we already know the newborn's gut, micro, gut environment is actually very, very vastly different than that uh, in adults. So uh, right after birth, uh, the nutrients actually come mainly from breast milk. And at the same time, there's relatively high oxygen content. And uh, so we know the gut bacterial uh, species are uh, different in babies uh, compared to that in adults. But so far, there's not a lot know about the neurotransmitters in babies' intestine. So this is where we uh, were when uh, my postdoc, Catherine Senedad, joined my lab. So here we uh, profile the metabolites in the small intestine of P14 uh, neonatal mice compared to that in adults mice. As you can see, uh, a lot of the, new, the 
uh, sorry, the metabolites were uh, differentially abundant in the neonatal intestine. And uh, interestingly, we found that the metabolites that were highly elevated in the neonatal intestine were mostly neurotransmitters, including uh, acetylcholine, uh, serotonin. And that's a little surprising to us uh, because I thought the, the neonatal gut environment might be relatively uh, less developed. And somehow they were able to make a lot more neurotransmitters. And I, I think having the neurotransmitters at such high levels during that developmental period might be critical. There's obviously a reason for that. Um, so we wanted to see how uh, what's really facilitating the uh, high amounts of serotonin in the neonatal intestine. Uh, just very, very simple, simplistically, um, serotonin is derived from dietary tryptophan to TPH1, and then it can be further broken down into 5-HIAA to uh, monoamine A, uh, MOA. And so here, if you compare the expression of MLA in the small intestine of the neonatal mice. In the adult mice, uh, we saw no difference between germ-free and non-germ-free mice. However, now we, when we only compare that in the, the neonates, we see that uh, there's high levels of MLA expression in the germ-free small intestine neonatal mice, uh, but very, very reduced levels in the normal um, neonatal mice with gut microbiome, suggesting the gut bacteria may be inhibiting the expression of MLA to break down serotonin. And uh, we see that at, at the protein level as well. So this might be one mechanism by which the gut bacteria in the neonatal intestine help facilitate higher uh, abundance of serotonin. Uh, as I mentioned, TPH1 is very really important to convert uh, tryptophan to serotonin. And uh, it's mainly done by entochromophan cells. So the TPH1 from entochromophan cells will facilitate that process. And that's really what we know in the adult. So um, here, if you remove TPH1 from entochromophan cells, using the virulent Cree, we do see a reduction in serotonin in the adult small intestine. And that's really consistent with the prior study by Dr. Lei Shao's lab. Um, however, now when we remove TPH1 in the entochromophan cells in the neonatal intestine, not only that we're not really seeing a reduction in serotonin, it's actually slightly higher when we remove the TPH1 in the intercomorphan cells in the neonatal intestine. So this really demonstrates that there's a very distinct mechanism to uh, facilitate serotonin uh, biosynthesis in the neonatal gut, which is really different than what we know about that process in the adult intestine. And we actually found that uh, there are some specific bacteria that might be unique in the neonatal intestine that directly make serotonin. Uh, so here we isolated a huge library of uh, bacterial -like isolates from the neonatal intestine. And then uh, by ELISA, we were able to demonstrate that they directly make serotonin. We found the same thing in uh, human bacterial isolates from uh, infants as well. Uh, as an immunologist, I am most interested in the immune response and serotonin is most well described for its impact on neurons. So as an immunologist, I wanted to see now what's the reason for having such high levels of serotonin in the neonatal brain. So we know during early developments, uh, being able to develop immune tolerance during that critical time developmental period is really important. So you don't want the babies to develop immune reactions to dietary antigens when they start eating solid foods. Or you don't want them to develop immune reactions to commensal bacteria when they're just having the gut microbiome developing. And so during that time window, uh, when they're able to develop immune tolerance, 
that will help really facilitate the uh, developments of the gut microbiome and help them to really uh, absorb nutrients that are critical for that development as well. So here to see if xanthona may actually impact the immune cells, we did a very simple assay. We did a CHOS assay, uh, added, adding 5-HT uh, xanthona to the T cells we were able to see a reduction in the oxygen consumption of the T cells, suggesting may, maybe there's some changes in the T cell metabolic state. And then we further, by uh, using the mTOR activation marker, uh, PRPS6, we showed that adding serotonin to the T cells can actually reduce uh, mTOR uh, activation. To further really understand what's going on, so here now we treated the T cells with serotonin and then profile the intracellular metabolites within the T cells. And we saw a variety of metabolites that were elevated in the serotonin treated T cells. In particular, we saw uh, indoacetaldehyde, uh, I3A, that in particular went up really high uh, in the serotonin treated T cells. And to see if that may be mediating the changes in the mTOR activation, now we only treated the T cells with uh, I3A, and we were able to see an inhibition of mTOR1 uh, activation. And now to come back to see the T cell response. So mTOR activation has been pretty uh, well study now uh, in T cells. So in general, uh, it promotes the differentiation of pro-inflammatory Th1, Th2, or Th17 cells. At the same time, it will restrict the differentiation of regulatory T cells. And regulatory T cells are other cells that can suppress inflammation. So to see whether now serotonin can actually change the T cell response, we uh, found that when you add serotonin to the T cells uh, ex vivo, uh, now uh, after 48 hours, now you, you see increased abundance of Trax. At the same time, a reduction in interferon gamma producing or l 17 producing T cells, suggesting serotonin can actually promote the Trax while suppressing the differentiation of other T cell subsets. And to see that may have some uh, impact on immune tolerance uh, during early life uh, in, in vivo. So here we did an assay, we orally gavaged the germ-free neonates with serotonin just twice. And then we sensitized them to over antigen, which here would represent a dietary antigen. And then later on, when they became adults, we rechallenged them with the same dietary antigens. We found that when the mice were treated with serotonin uh, orally, when they were just neonate, uh, later on when they were exposed to the same antigens in adults, uh, as in adults, we actually saw that the serotonin exposed neo mice had lower over specific IgG and IgE. So this really suggests that there might be some uh, critical role for serotonin in the neonatal gut uh, during early developments to really shape the T cell response such that uh, it would suppress the T cell activation when they encounter dietary antigens. So later on in life, when, when, when they encounter the, the same dietary antigens, they're not really developing a, a T cell reaction to the dietary antigens. And to really understand whether that's really facilitated by the T-Rex that we know are generated, uh, mediated by the uh, serotonin exposed T cells. So now we did a similar experiment. Uh, we uh, we treated the neonatal mice with serotonin very earlier at day eight and day nine when they were neonates and then uh, sensitized them with the over antigen. And now we isolated the T-Rex from the intestines of those mice and adaptively transfer into a new set of, of mice. And now we challenged the new mice with the over antigen. And we here demonstrated that the adaptive transfer of the T-Rex from the serotonin uh, 
treated mice were able to was able to re, uh, reduce the uh, immune reaction to the over antigen in the new mice. So really suggesting the Trax as uh, a, a an important mediators of uh, serotonin uh, mediated immune uh, tolerance in early life. Um, and uh, here we wanted to also see maybe serotonin is doing something to the gut commands of bacteria. Uh, so here we pretreated the germ-free mice with serotonin and then we transplanted the gut commands of bacteria into the mice uh, after like a week. And later on, uh, after two weeks, we saw uh, increase in T-Rex in the colon of the intestine and at the same time reduced T17 cells in the intestine. We also saw drastic changes in the mice treated with serotonin or PBS, suggesting so serotonin uh, either directly uh, signaling to the uh, gut bacteria and changing the gut commensal uh, composition or by changing the T cell response, they uh, change the gut bacterial community. So what I just shown today is really showing the, the immune modulatory effects of uh, serotonin, uh, specifically during that uh, early developmental period, we found that somehow babies have more serotonin in the intestine. And, and besides possibly affecting the enteric nervous system, the serotonin that can uh, directly uh, signal to the T cells in, in, in a way to facilitate regulatory T cell developments in the, in the gut. And, and that may be critical for developing uh, immune tolerance to dietary antigens and uh, commensal bacteria in the, in the babies. And so that's what we have so far. Uh, thank you so much for your attention and I'll be happy to take questions later on. Okay. It's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to introduce um, Dr. Michael Fischbach, who is Associate Professor of Bioengineering at uh, Stanford University and a Chan Zuckerberg Biohub uh, investigator. Uh, Professor Fischbach is a chemist, a microbiologist, and geneticist. He pursued his undergraduate education at Harvard College and subsequently a PhD in chemistry and chemical biology from Harvard University uh, in the laboratory of Chris Walsh. Uh, Professor Pushbach's uh, laboratory focuses on discovering and characterizing small molecules from microorganisms with an emphasis on the human uh, microbiome. Um, in addition, he develops computational tools that identify small molecule producing genes in the bacterial genome. Uh, in addition, uh, to his ongoing work on the genetics and ecology of complex uh, microbial communities. Uh, and with that uh, introduction, I will turn the podium over to uh, Professor Fischbach. Thank you so much for the introduction. Let me just confirm that you can that you can hear me. We can hear you. Great. And then I'm also going to confirm that I um, I think it's Jessica has been uh, communicating with me on AV and, and is a, um, a gem. And I want to make sure that when I click the slide advances and it does, that's amazing. Thank you for that. Okay. So, um, wonderful thing. <laughs> yeah. Woo. Um, I'm really sorry. I couldn't be there with you in person, but I'm delighted to be speaking here. Um, many thanks for having me. And I wanted to, um, I, I want to jump right in on a story that, that, uh, is work from Kazuki. He's a, a very talented scientist in the lab. Um, I, I won't belabor this because I want to uh, I want to show you this technology that we've been working on that I um, that I think could be um, helpful to some people in picking things apart mechanistically uh, as they relate to gut brain circuits and, and other aspects of physiology that are impacted by the microbiome. So let me cue it up by explaining the the interest that we had and the problem we encountered. So we we were very interested in um, studying. A, a variety of 
ways that the microbiome impacts the host. Here, I'm going to focus on immunology. So the, the studies that got us the most interested were ones with the format shown on the left, where a fecal sample, often from a human, would be transplanted into a germ-free mouse, and then some interesting phenotype would come along for the ride. These are really interesting experiments in demonstrating that the microbiome is involved somehow physiologically in, in a phenotype of interest, but they're, um, they're frustrating in the sense that it's difficult to figure out how, how it worked which bugs were responsible and by what mechanism. There are other immunologic experiments that, that we were also interested in where, where folks would transplant a single organism or a small community and then see some impact on, on immune modulation. The, these are interesting as well. We've done experiments like this, but then the problem we've always run into is that the same bug in the context of a, of a complex community, sort of a, a physiologic complexity, doesn't do the same thing. And so we think that the data are accurate in some sense, but they're not reporting on something that's going to teach us much about the real biology. And so we envisioned a, a, a different format in which we could transplant a community that had um, the advantages of being defined, meaning we know exactly who's in there, but also complex enough to capture the salient biology of, of the microbiome or enough of it anyway, that we would learn something that could stand the test of time about what uh, one organism or another contributes to to a phenotype like immune modulation. So, in um, in, in thinking about doing this, we had um, the the good fortune of work that another member of the lab, Alice Chang, was was doing. She's a physician scientist who had built a complex community that is meant to be a model system for the human gut microbiome, and had done a lot of work to show. Um, that that it engrafts stably in mice. This is a community at, at this point of 119 organisms. And the, I'm not going to go into detail on it because I want to show you about the immune modulation stuff. But suffice it to say that when we colonize mice, it colonizes very reproducibly and stably and, uh, and that the organisms in the community distribute themselves across roughly six orders of magnitude of relative abundance, much as we think you would find in, in a typical human gut. Uh, so, so we think this is a... a reasonable model system to move forward with even as we improve it in the background and hopefully make better versions of it. So here's the kind of experiment that was really the reason for the for wanting to to do the work of putting together a model system like that. This is a good example of the kind of thing that I think is possible to do now that wouldn't have been easy to do beforehand where Kazuki propagated the community as individual strains, mixed them to, together, colonized a germ-free mouse, <clears throat> waited 2 weeks and then isolated T cells from the gut. Then at this point, he could take this pool of T cells from the gut and incubate them one at a time with every bug in the community to figure out what each individual organism is contributing to the overall phenotype of immune modulation uh, by the gut microbiome. And so the data from that experiment look like this. I'm showing you a phylogenetic tree of the organisms in our community on the left side of the screen. This is the top third of that phylogenetic tree. Um, and the single dot that the um, uh, that this dotted line is coming off of indicates that this organism, Intestinobacter bartletii, re-stimulates roughly 10% of the T regs in the gut, um, and uh, and so then the rest of the dots correspond to what each individual organism is contributing to the pool of Th17 cells and T regs. Uh, in these T follicular helper cells uh, that, that we call FR4 positive TH cells. And so this is um, sort of a, a, a plot that shows you what each organism is contributing. This is the, the most of the firmicutes. If I click forward, you'll see the, the contribution that the remaining firmicutes and the actinobacteria in the community have. And then the, the last click forward is, is the bacteroidetes. And so we, we had initially intended in this story to find um, potent inducers of Treg and Th17 cells that didn't just work when they were on their own, but they worked in the context of a complex community so that we were going to characterize them in detail. That was going to be like the second half of our story. But instead, we got captivated by a different observation, which I think was uh, one of the joys of working with a system like this. The unexpected result was that if you add up the total um, percentages of the of the entire pool of T cells that are re-stimulated by a number of these organisms, you realize very quickly that it adds up to much more than 100%. And so an old model that we had had in our mind from pioneering work that uh, people like Yasmin Belkade and Dan Lippman had done was that each individual organism was going to elicit its own pool 
of, of T cells that were entirely specific for that organism in the host. And so this one-to-one -one relationship is what we had expected to see. In this data, um, we, we, we realized that that couldn't be possible in this experiment because the, the total number would have added up to much more than 100%. And so we wanted to go deeper in terms of resolution. Um, and, and I'll show you what we did. And I think this also highlights sort of the capabilities of a defined system like this. Um, so clicking forward um, or attempting to click forward. There we go. Yeah, I think that that's displayed visually is that the old, the old model we had had in our mind is that the blue strain induces a pool of T cells on the host side that are specific for the blue bug. So too, the dark red strain induces a pool of T cells on the host side that are specific for it. But we, we began adding up the percentages of the pool represented by the cells on the right and realized it added up to much more than 100%. So what's going on here? So Kazuki did an experiment that starts out the same way, but ends ends up in, in sort of a bit of a more uh, interesting place where he he propagates the individual strains in the community, mixes them together, waits for, for two weeks and isolates T cells just as before. But now he does a single cell RNA sequencing experiment combined with T TCR sequencing. So here we have for about 10,000 cells, a tiny slice off the top of the T cell repertoire, um, single cell RNA sequencing data and, and the sequence of the T cell receptor. And um, <clears throat> through, through a process that I'd be happy to answer questions about, but, I, uh, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move through quickly here, he picked a subset of these T cells. Not all of them are going to be specific for the microbiome. He picked a subset that had, uh, that had expanded recently. We could see that there were multiple cells in the pool that expressed the same T cell receptor, indicating that they, they had divided recently. And he hypothesized that those were going to be enriched in cells that were specific for one or another bug in the community. And then um, took... 92 such cells, and we just had twist synthesize the, the whole sequence of the T cell receptor. And then Kazuki used a retrovirus to integrate the, that, that artificial gene encoding the T cell receptor into a, a stable cell line. So then we had 92 different cell lines, each making one TCR that we were crossing our fingers and hoping at least some of them would be specific for a bug in the community. So every one of those 92 cell lines by the hundred or so bugs in our community, that that matrix well, it was a big ELISA experiment. And then that enabled us to draw sort of a, a map for this tiny little portion of the T cell repertoire of exactly which cells were re-stimulated by which bugs. And, and so the portion of that heat map that has data is shown here. Not every bug in our community re-stimulated one of those cell lines. Not every cell line was re-stimulated by one of those bugs. But to make a long story short, there were these little chunks of the heat map which represent sets of T cell receptors. These are each each one of these rows is a cell line that expresses a single T cell receptor from that mouse. And then each one of these columns is one of the bugs in our community. And you can see that there's a whole set of, of TCR clonotypes that are being re-stimulated by a bunch of the gram positive bugs in our community. And so Kazuki went back in with another kind of high resolution experiment that would have been difficult to do. Um, I, I, I should say graphically, just to kind of close the loop here, how what we, what we began to think from this is that there's a pool of T cells in the host that are that seemed to be re-stimulated by a bunch of different bugs at the same time. So Kazuki wanted to figure out what's going on there. Um, and to do that, he made genomic DNA libraries from three of those gram-positive organisms from that feature in the heat map to figure out like what gene in their genome what was the was being recognized, what, what was the epitope. And so he made shotgun genomic libraries from each of those strains, formatted them in a big kind of pooled library experiment, and then mixed them together with that pool of 13 stable cell lines that were all re-stimulated by the gram-positive organisms in the community. So that, that rather large matrix um, uh, became a screen. The screen delightfully had only three hits, and those hits overlapped around a single region of the genome that is conserved not only in these three organisms that he had made shotgun genomic libraries from, but all of the gram-positive organisms that, uh, that, that were stimulatory in that feature in the upper left-hand corner of our heat map. What is this thing? It's a system that sits on the outside of, of some gram-positive organisms. It's widely conserved in our community where the, the epitopic or the, the epitope that we, we eventually identified is in this lipoprotein called a substrate binding protein that's very boring. It just sits on the outside of the cell and grabs a sugar and dumps it down an ABC transporter. Um, we now know that this protein, we think that one of the reasons it's 
it's recognized by the, the by T cells in the repertoire is that it's widely conserved and also very highly expressed, both when you grow one of the organisms from our community in, in culture, and if you tile reads from human metatranscriptomic data from, from human subjects in a, in a study, um, this is one of the most highly expressed genes in the genome of, of this organism and now others that we've looked at in vivo in the human gut. So we think that that's, that's probably a lot of the reason why the, the host is recognizing it as a T cell epitope. And we've even been able to narrow down to the specific conserved peptide at the C terminus of this protein that seems to be recognized. So all of that is to say that I think the use of a defined community gives us some added resolution on the microbial side and makes it possible to go well beyond where we've been able to go when we use undefined communities in experiments where we colonize germ-free mice. And so we're excited to hear ideas from other people and ways in which this, this could be a resource that would help other people make discoveries where we would are, are looking for ways to propagate, to, to promulgate, I should say, this technology and send our defined communities out into the world. Well, thank you for listening. Uh, I'd be delighted to, to take questions now or later. Thank you so, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fishbach. Our uh, next speaker will be, and I let me just interrupt and say we are running way over. So if you'll indulge us, we'll go past uh, the end period of this um, with questions. But our next speaker is uh, Diego Borjoquez who is an associate professor of medicine and a research track associate professor of neurobiology at Duke University. And he studies the gut brain sensory transduction, uh, what, what is sort of a new field called sensory biology. Please, Dr. Dr. Diego. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Can, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Perfect. Ah. Good morning, everyone. So uh, I don't think that I can control the slides yet. Are the slides moving? The slides are moving, yes. Perfect. Ah. <laughs> it's about time for a uh, launch. And you will um, not let me lie that next time that you go to the grocery store, you realize that how about 95% of our decisions are actually visceral in nature, in specifically when it comes to food. It's amazing how we are persuaded to just grab one of those Kit Kats when we are about to pay for food. And by the time that we get to the uh, parking lot, we have already eaten half of it and we don't even realize what it has, how it is that uh, we came to that decision. But uh, if you ask any behavioral economist, they actually know that there are hidden forces that shape our decisions, in fact, uh, Dan Ariely, who has in this very influential book, Predictably Irrational, uh, uh, shows that, at least behaviorally, that about nine in 10 of our decisions are influenced by the viscera, but the neural basis of it has large, large, largely been unknown. So as early as the 1900s, we already, already had a very good understanding of the chemistry of how is it that we break down food into small molecules that we can digest up and absorb. So if we take that piece of chocolate and we break it down into pieces. When it goes down through the sofa, it goes into the stomach. It gets bathed, bathed by hydrochloric acid, pepsin, renin. And then the gear keeper, uh, Mr. Pylorus, we let the chyme flow into the intestine where truly the magic happens. Uh, the intestine is where uh, these basic building blocks of life will be uh, not only further digested, but also absorbed and will go into circulation. And from that is that new cells are replicated. So that's how we acquire our proteins, fats, and our sugars. So even though we have known quite a bit about the chemistry of the digestion um, for a long time, uh, how is it that the intestine recognizes those nutrients that we just ate to be able to guide our appetitive decisions? Uh, it has been largely unknown. And in fact, here is one of my uh, favorite papers. Comes is a classic paper from uh, Professor Gibbs, who was at Columbia, I believe, at that time in 1973. 
And the, uh, the first sentence is a classic sentence. It says that within 10 minutes of starting to eat, a rat stops eating, grooms for a short period of time, then usually sleeps. We define this behavioral sequence as a tidy and its physiological basis is unknown. And this is the first time that they go on to propose that the gut, after sensing nutrients, it is capable of releasing these endocrine factors like called cystokinin that after several minutes, five, 10, in fact, after 30 minutes peak in the bloodstream. And that those signaling molecules are partially responsible for inducing satiety in the animal. So they signal full, fullness from the intestine to the brain, and then the animal feels full. But if the, the, the hormone peaks after 30 minutes, uh, here very clearly said that within 10 minutes of starting to eat, the rat has already not only like brush her teeth, put on PJs, PJs and get inside of her bed, you know, so what happens in those first 10 minutes uh, is really, it was really a black box for a long time. And here I'm gonna, uh, and uh, the idea is that the nutrients will get into the intestine and then will st stimulate these cells that are known as enteroendocrine cells or cells that release hormones. And those hormones will either go into the bloodstream or will activate some uh, nerve interference by diffusion that ultimately will carry the signals. But in recent years, we have had access to new technology that has really helped us to visualize what is it that is happening well before the signals reach the threshold of consciousness and we can are able to actually articulate that we feel full. So this is a, a beautiful example that uh, it comes out of a technology that was optimized, uh, developed and optimized by uh, Professor Teresa Lieber and her laboratory at the University of Missouri. So she's a collaborator of us. And when I saw this, this video, I was fascinated by the speed at which nutrients actually get to the intestine. So what you're seeing here is a mouse that has been sated and is, gonna, is about to eat a semi-liquid uh, diet on the right. And uh, it is a, being a, imaged uh, with this X-ray microsystem. So the mouse goes to the right and starts to eat. And then quickly within a couple of seconds, you can see the food already arrives in the stomach. And within a couple of more seconds more, it starts to diffuse in the intestine and really expel into the intestine. And if you see with high con uh, in high contrast, this video, you can see that it goes throughout the entire intestine. So within only a few seconds, uh, the food has already arrived into the intestine. So how is it that those signals get to the brain and what is the, the consequence of those signals uh, reaching the brain? So one experiment that perhaps my laboratory uh, is well known for, and it was really a catalyzing moment in this understanding of sensory transduction or the ability of nutrients to be converted into an electrical pulse that ultimately will guide appetitive decisions. Uh, it was this experiment that I often call as two brains in a dish. On the right-hand side, you're gonna see the sensory neuron from the brain. And on the left-hand side, you're gonna see this uh, green cell from the gut. And when they are put together in culture, uh, you will see what happens after a few hours in culture. So again, on the left, you have the gut, and on the right, you have the brain. So not only is fascinating that a cranial neur neuron is able to uh, uh, regenerate, uh, re regenerate an axon after being cultured, but also that these cells, these two cells are able to find each other, and the nutrient sensing cell in the gut is able to connect directly. So this is not by the diffusion of hormones, but actually a physical connection with uh, that sensory neuron. As a consequence, uh, in 2018, we coined a new term and we call these cells neuropod cells because they have the ability that in space and time to transduce signals from the lumen of the intestine into the nervous system that ultimately guide uh, behavior. So here we have neuropod cell, I get sensory epithelial cell that synapses with nerves, 
to transduce the stimuli in milliseconds. So uh, this is the first part of the, the, the talk. And I wanted to summarize with a series of experiments that ultimately have helped us to document the neural basis of uh, sugar preference that goes all the way from the specific receptor in the gastrointestinal tract to the cells, the neurotransmitters, and the circuitry. And this video summarizes uh, that work that uh, my laboratory has done over the last 12 years. Have you ever wondered where our sugar cravings come from? Scientists have long known that our preference for sugar does not depend on its sweet taste alone. Instead, our preference for sugar depends on a sensation arising from the gut. But how the gut guides our preference for sugar over artificial sweeteners was obscure until now. When sugar molecules enter the intestine, they are recognized by sensory cells. One of these is the neuropod cell. Neuropod cells synapse with the vagus nerve to tell the brain about sugars entering the intestine in milliseconds. We wondered if these cells are necessary to discern nutritive sugars from non-caloric sweeteners. We found that neuropod cells sense sweeteners using the sweet taste receptor T1R3. This causes the release of the neurotransmitter ATP. But sugars are sensed differently. Neuropod cells sense sugars using SGLT1, an electrogenic sodium glucose transporter. When glucose enters through SGLT1, neuropod cells release the neurotransmitter glutamate. As such, neuropod cells convey signals from sweeteners using ATP and from sugars using glutamate. But does the animal preference for sugars depend on neuropod cells? To answer this question, we used optogenetics. This technique allows researchers to silence or excite neuropod cells while a mouse is presented with a choice of sugars versus sweeteners. We discovered that when neuropods are silenced, the mouse cannot distinguish the sugar from the sweetener. It becomes blind to sugar. A mouse presented with a bottle containing sweetener consumes only small amounts of the liquid, but exciting their neuropod cells causes the mouse to double its intake of the sweetener. It drinks the sweetener as if it were sugar. By sensing nutrients, neuropod cells convey rapid subliminal sensations to convert food into feelings. So what is fascinating is that the gut has the wisdom to sort very rapidly uh, chemical properties, and for that matter, physical properties of a specific chemical molecule, in this case, a nutrient, and then being able to inform in real time uh, the brain. So, uh, behavior can be adjusted. And as we know, the gut in, in, in a human is a large organ, in fact, for that matter, in, um, in terms of uh, proportion. Uh, it's a very large organ in all organisms. In the human, in an average human, uh, adult human, the gut is about eight meters long. So here, what I show you is what happens in the proximal small intestine. What, but what about in other segments of the intestine? And here's where uh, several years ago, we began working on uh, a, this project to be able to not only track the circuitry, but also see what happens in different regions of the gastrointestinal tract. And uh, this project uh, began with tracking the circuitry of uh, the gut using uh, a monosynaptic rabies virus. So we discovered that in wild type animals, these neuropod cells, they actually get infected by uh, a rabies. As you can see here, uh, this is one of the first images of our data. And then if we enable that rabies to spread by Krilog speed recombination, then this, the, the rabies is spread onto uh, neurons, including uh, vagal nodus neurons. And uh, depending on where uh, those neurons are projecting, obviously the, the function of those circuitry are different. 
So one of the, the so this, this work had two very clear implications. One was that the gut, like the nose, like the tongue, like the skin has physical circuitry to be able to transduce a sense. So two neurons, an epithelial cell, a neuroepithelial cell, and a sensor neuron connect to each other to bring that sensor information from the lumen of the intestine into uh, the brain. And in this case, uh, uh, some of the terminals from the vagal nervous neurons will end in the nucleus tractus solitarius uh, in the brain. And the second uh, implication is that as Ilya Meshnikov in 1908 put it, death begins in the colon that uh, through the circuitry, if there are some pathogens that could be able to access the circuitry, they will be um, they will have access to the brain. And as there's quite a bit of interest today in neurodegenerative diseases, this actually provides a path for pathogens to be able to access the central nervous system. But what about uh, the interaction with uh, microbes? So we came, became uh, interested in, in this topic, building on uh, the pioneering work of uh, uh, Sarkis, uh, Mauro, uh, Elaine, uh, and others, and uh, began wondering whether or not the circuitry in different types or in different parts of the intestine will actually convey very rapidly sensory information to the brain to uh, regulate uh, behavior. So as we know, uh, microbes can regulate uh, behavior and this has been done in, by doing these microbial transplants and also in germ-free mice. So here we have this role of the entire intestine and colon on the left and um, a, in uh, a transgenic mouse in which the promoter for the hormone peptide, the, neuro, the neuropeptide peptide YY drives the expression of GFP in this way, we can label uh, these cells. And one of the things that we quickly realize is that these cells in the colon specifically, they are highly enriched in this toy-like receptor five. And we realized this like over six years ago, so one of the first experiments that we ran is what would happen if we knock out uh, this receptor specifically in these cells on the, on the colon. And one of the, the things that uh, we found uh, is that these animals not only become overweight over time, but also like their meal pattern, uh, including the meal duration and the meal size is altered. And is what is fascinating is that they actually do not develop metabolic syndrome uh, they do not show like an inflammatory response, but rather they just simply eat uh, more. And working through the pathway, uh, a, always let me just share here a very short summary. Uh, these uh, neuropod cells in the colon, they are capable of recognizing flagelling. And when flagelling is delivered into the lumen of the colon, it rapidly activates vagal uh, nodus neurons that innervate uh, the colon. So when we use optogenetics in this case, um, a, a halorhodopsin using halorhodopsin, uh, a, and we provide with the right type of the light and we silence these neuropod cells, then we get rid of that vagal activation, demonstrating that these neuropod cells in the colon are necessary for a, the excitation of the vagus nerve and for the transmission of that flagelling stimulus onto the vagus nerve. Uh, very rapidly. And you can see here that um, also, uh, as I mentioned, if we put the flagellin directly into the lumen of the colon, we get a very rapid vagal activation, as you see in that uh, green bar. But in the knockout, uh, in the PYY TLR5 knockout a mouse, that activation does not occur. And <coughs> as you can see, that the food intake, if we deliver directly the, the, the flagellin directly into the lumen of the colon, uh, over 20, 40, and 60 minutes actually reduces the amount of food intake in the mouse, but in the PYY creatinine receptor uh, a five knockout mouse, that effect does not happen, showing that the circuitry from gut to brain from the lumen of the colon actually is capable of recognizing uh, the stimulus flagellin and through the activation of TLR5, on these PYY neuropod cells activates a gut-brain neural circuit that ultimately modulates uh, food intake. So finally, I just want to uh, share with you that uh, next year, GastroNuts is, is gonna be uh, organizing uh, our 
Third global symposium, it will be in, in Galapagos, the famous islands, uh, on June 1st uh, to the 3rd of 2023. So if you are interested, please take a look at it. And then obviously the music comes from uh, the team. I'm here to uh, represent them. And I wanna thank them for all the, the work that, that they do. And thank you all for your attention and thank you, uh, Kanye, for the invitation. Fantastic presentations this morning. And uh, the last uh, speaker for this morning is uh, Vanessa Ridura. I hope that's the correct pronunciation, who is a senior program officer at the Gates Foundation uh, and leading the microbiome products um, uh, thrust of, um, of all that uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is involved in. Uh, Dr. Ridura. Uh, received her undergraduate degree at the University Simon Bolivar and pursued her uh, doctoral studies at Washington University in St. Louis uh, in molecular genetics in the laboratory of Professor Jeff Gordon. Uh, she subsequently pursued a postdoctoral fellowship with Yasmin Belcade at the NIH and prior to uh, her position at the Gates Foundation uh, led Project Baseline at Verily Life Sciences. Uh, Dr. Radura, the, uh, the podium is yours. Thank you so much. Um, in Spanish, we say Ridaura, but I know it's like always really confusing. Um, thank you everyone for being here and thank you. I know we're running over time for taking the time to listen to what we're trying to do at the foundation. Um, and I think I can move the slides yet. Yeah. I wanted to start with a quick overview of where our team sits, and that will provide a little bit of context with, for the type of things that we're funding and the interest that we have. So uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, BMGF uh, program strategies are divided across six divisions, and our team, the Maternal Newborn Child Health Discovery and Tools team, I know it's a mouthful, uh, falls under the gender equality team. This is really important. Um, for us because of the type of investments and proposals that we're trying to fund. Specifically, our team here in red is responsible for funding drugs, food and microbes, devices and software, epidemiology insights and discovery insights, all aimed at improving the health of mother and children. And the reason that I wanted to bring up a little bit of the GE division and the gender equality division is because we just recently moved to it. And I think it's going to underlie a lot of like the way that we're thinking of funding for uh, the topics at hand. And the gender equality division uh, vision is to achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls, which is a sustainable development goal uh, for um, a UNICEF and the UN. And the division goal specifically is to accelerate that trajectory in Sub-Saharan African and South Asian countries. And you'll see that the way that we're trying to do that is by really focusing and removing barriers to gender equality by not only what we fund, but who we fund. And I wanted to bring that up in these four different uh, sub goals. The first one will be to um, understand that when women and children have good health and autonomy over their bodies, they thrive their, uh, and other areas of their life thrives and everyone associated with them thrives as well. Uh, women's economic opportunity and decision-making power really grows in the house, uh, grows household income and keeps more children in school. So if we help women, uh, we will help their families as well. And something that I, I hold dear, near and dear to my heart when thinking about investments and how we do them is that changing the people in the decision-making room with uh, more women in leadership roles will really continue the cycle of empowerment. And I think about this a lot when considering investment and uh, our grantees and um, uh, partners. Finally, we really are uh, thriving to uh, strengthen positive social norms about women and girls, fostering an ecosystem that will support gender equality by using the strategic goal of accelerating these declines in neonatal and maternal mortality while supporting growth and resilience. And you'll see that exemplified by what we're trying to go do with the gut microbiome portfolio. 
uh, the strategic principles for our team is that we're going to be addressing underlying biological risk rather than focusing on a specific indication or single syndrome, which is a little bit different to other teams at the foundation. We try to intervene as early as possible in the life course with a prevention approach and then also fund treatment based in, um, interventions that can help reduce the morbidity associated with uh, longer life in some of these scenarios. We also want to improve on the ground data and then push to global guidelines that will uh, impact all of the population at hand. And finally, what we try and do is work through local. So um, from the optimal to the possible, and that's what we're focusing in with this portfolio. It's really optimizing these learnings to accelerate translation. And the goal that we want to have in the next four-year period is to really have a body of work that will answer the questions about the role of the maternal microbiome during pregnancy and help us inform a target product profile, uh, the population, and the mechanisms of actions that we should be targeted with these interventions. And uh, specifically, we want to hone in into using this experimental learning capacity, going back and forth with preclinical models to design an intervention that it's going to impact the biggest population possible by improving uh, not only the final biomarkers, which will not be powered to see, uh, the final um, outcomes, which will not be powered to see, but transitional biomarkers that we will continue to refine and define in these studies. And um, I wanted to end there and then just quote uh, something that one of our um, co-founders, co Melinda, said is that the beauty of our fight for gender equality, which interestingly goes beyond just fighting for this rights, but really focusing in scientific questions that will improve the life of mother and children, is that uh, every human being will gain from it, not only uh, women and children. The 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 points and, and areas that we wanted to go next is really understanding microbiome in pregnancy by uh, targeting immune adaptations through pregnancy, understanding the interplay between the vaginal and the gut microbiome during pregnancy, and uh, finding ways to study how uh, the gut microbiome can Im impact placental development. And with that, I just want to thank you, and I hope that you guys have a great lunch. We're going to try and spend uh, maybe uh, 10 to 15 minutes in question and answer. Um, we know we've cut into your lunch time, so we thank you for, for allowing us to spend some extra time with this. Um, want to remind you, if you have questions, uh, please put them in uh, Slido. And if you're on the Zoom, please raise your electronic hand and we will call on you. Um, but uh, maybe we can get started with one question, if you don't mind me asking which is uh, what is really interesting about all of these talks, um, not only is this idea that, that the gut microbiome and the immune system and external sort of stimuli are all affecting not only each other, but, the, but how our behavior, our behavior, our you know, sort of neurological state and development. And, um, and in this last talk, uh, Vanessa talked about experimental learning models and thinking about translation of some of that basic research. And I'm just sort of interested in understanding um, how, where along the spectrum are some of the research that we talked about and how can we think about better translating into actual sort of practice? Um, are there things to, to sort of help with that ongoing learning from basic research to its applications and then back again for anybody who would like to ask the question. Anyone like to uh, weigh in? I guess uh, maybe a, uh, a complementary way of framing this is uh, strength and weaknesses of our preclinical models that allow us to uh, translate uh, with predictable results. And I think that's been alluded to by a, a number of the speakers. Um, you know, it's sort of bench to bedside and back again. Um, and, and so I'm wondering if a few could talk about um, some of these strengths and weaknesses, both of using uh, murine models, you know, with inherent uh, murine uh, microbiota, uh, alternative models, which were alluded to by Dr. Fishbach, which is defined uh, communities of, of bacteria, but then the challenges of 
um, a high level of diversity from one patient population to another or one geography from another. Uh, and, and sort of where our preclinical models have succeeded uh, and where they failed, or is it just too difficult to tell at this very early stage of the career? Uh, Michael, maybe you could start off and then uh, Melody, Vanessa, um, Diego could, could weigh in as well. Yeah, this is a really interesting set of questions. And I, I, um, I don't know if I can offer a panoramic perspective. I think that as far as the defined communities go, I think the it, it's exactly what you would expect from something that's that's new. It's a bit young and unrefined, and and so far we only have one community that we've published on, and another one that we're building in house. I think the the bright side is that um, they're they're going to be shared widely and and without any constraints, so that everybody can do whatever they want with them, and and even beyond that, we we are delighted to build communities for people that are missing certain organisms or groups of organisms in case that would be helpful so we we want we want to um uh to send this out as far and as wide as possible the constraint that you noted about you know that that all we have is of one community that represents some kind of average at at one point in time is, is right on i mean i think that we'll learn as much as we can from that um you know, just sort of basic fundamental things that that would apply, hopefully some of them to other communities. But then in in cases where we're interested in a particular malady, um, we have begun reconstructing communities from from patients who have a disease. Um, and and I think that that too is going to be something that we can learn a lot from in in the early cases that we've been working on, we, we can capture the phenotype that we're after by by building a new community from scratch. It's a difficult process right now. It would take a couple of people a couple of months to make one community. Hopefully the technology behind that will change and make it possible to do that faster. But right now it's still a serial one-off process. So we'll have to choose carefully. Uh, others should comment on like the quality of, of the animal models and you know, where, where I have much less depth. Yeah, can, can I jump in? I, I would just add this. Can we take a step back? Because you go to preclinical, clinical, ask a simple question physiologically. Where in the gut are the microbiota interacting with elements of the enteric nervous system? Because throughout the gut, it's not homogeneous. The ENS is differentially innervated. I'm sure Diego could speak to this much more than I, throughout the gut. So where are the bacteria? So as you eat food, they actually exist on the food and they will grow as biofilms as the food moves through. So do we know and how they communicate with the villi, remembering that in the colon, we have two types of mucus flowing through. Any surgeon will tell you that or operates on the patients for chronic surgery. You have a static layer that coats basically the villi. You have a moving layer that goes through and, and, and moves down the intestinal tract. The whole purpose of that is to keep the bacteria away from the villi and the innervated portions of the villi that will then hook up to the, e the ENS vagus brain. My question is asking, do we know where the communication pathways from a anatomical geographical version actually where they are? Because if you're going to design all these strategies about a microbiota, whether it's a defined community, do you know that the bacteria will proliferate, will survive to that region, will interact and proliferate in the region, deliver what they need to do? I think these are basic questions that need to be answered. Just my two cents. Yeah, that's an excellent point, Mark. And if I can, I'm sorry, I know that we had an order interject. <laughs> I will just say like both Michael and Mark, I think that I, both of your perspectives are complementary, right? Uh, there are techniques to isolate small intestinal bacteria to make sure that then you can build communities that will uh, colonize differentially throughout the gut. And I believe Michael's um, complex communities, if you just have all the members, they will take over whenever, wherever they are most able to thrive. Right. I think that one of the challenges that we do have, both in the cognitive world and in others, is that in some cases we don't even understand the etiology of the disease that we're studying. That is definitely the case with EED and certainly for IBD. So then what ends up happening is that even if you have a microbiome from a diseased individual, you don't have a model that really replicates the whole site of the disease. Um, that doesn't mean that all, mo I mean, all models are imperfect. It doesn't mean that you can't learn from them. Right. But that's, I think, where 
the power of this iteration with humans comes from. Because if you don't understand the disease, you can't mimic the disease in the murine model. Even if you have the right bacteria, you don't have the right host piece. Um, and I think that that becomes really challenging. Um, that yeah, that that's kind of my my two cents. But you're right, both of both Michael and Mark like. All diseases, EED, for example, is a disease of the small intestine. So if we try to build mouse models with colonic or fecal bacteria, we may be missing key players that are responsible for driving some aspects of the disease. Uh, definitely. I have more experience working with uh, preclinical mouse models. And I think one nice thing about using mouse models for study of uh, immune response during pregnancy is that it's just 21 days. So you can just look at first trimester, second trimester, third trimester every week, and you can look at a variety of things and easily manipulate the gut microbiome by putting in a defined sets of bacteria. Um, so that's really nice for us. We're able to isolate the uh, immune cells from the placenta and do single cell uh, RNA sequencing. Unfortunately, I didn't get to show that data today. And I do agree with Vanessa uh, and Dr. Uh, Mark Light that uh, it's very difficult to recapit recapitulate the niche that we see in humans than in mice. Um, for example, my lab, we actually transplant uh, stool samples from babies into germ-free mice, trying to really re rebuild that community that we see in babies in mice. The challenging part is we know a lot of the bacteria never survive the gut microenvironment. So what we end up seeing in the mice two weeks later is not really definitely not representative of what we see in babies. The microenvironment difference, the bacteria are not able to colonize well stably. So we've lost a lot of information during that process. So that's a huge limitation with really translating what we see uh, in humans with uh, the preclinical models. Diego, any thoughts? Um, I think that in terms of uh, priorities, if I would be to give us a perspective, I think that we have made tremendous progress in understanding some of the colonies and their interaction and the responses of the, uh, the host. Uh, I believe that there is, a, there is a strong opportunity to understand how is it that the microbes actually guide our appetitive decisions. Because ultimately the building block of the, the entire system is food, you know, and not only like the basic food that acts as a nutrient, but also like a additives that now we see very common in the food landscape. Uh, artificial sweeteners, flavors, and others. Um, a couple of months ago, I attended a conference in which I saw some very interesting and intriguing uh, data on how microbes, just by a supplementation of fiber, could supplement the basic protein needs or uh, essential amino acid needs of uh, the host. And I think that that brings uh, an entire new dimension in how is it that we are going to use the microbes to be able to uh, supplement dietary needs of populations uh, worldwide, because depending on where we are located, um, different microbes will be able to supplement those diet or affect those dietary needs of the population and at hand. Um, how to get to it? I think that uh, certainly like the epithelial interactions are very important. And the other one that uh, Mark actually highlighted is that it is very important to recognize that the gut is not a homogeneous organ, but rather uh, this very diverse, uh, long ecosystem. And depending on where the location is, the functions are very uh, different. And that's something that uh, several laboratories are actually beginning to take into account from the micro side, from the epithelial side, and also from the diversity of the enteric nerve. So, that would be my perspective. Yeah, I think it's a, a unifying theme, uh, not, not unique to this particular field, but that we can certainly learn a tremendous amount from mo mouse models, but there are huge limitations uh, and a big gap between creating truly humanized uh, versions of mouse models, particularly in this area. And then the risk is the tremendous amount of resources 
uh, that are being um, deployed uh, in the hope that they're predictive, only to find out that um, you know there are many different ways they fall short. I, I was wondering if I could follow up on, on two other themes that you um, alluded to, Diego, but all the other speakers spoke to as well, is the opportunities and the challenges with probiotics. And I'm just wondering if a number of you would um, weigh in on some of the challenges that you see in translating probiotics, you know, whether it's um, scalability, reproducibility, QA, QC, cost, um, where do you see it uh, succeeding and where, where are the dirty little secrets that uh, may hamper the movement of this field forward? Uh, Vanessa, you look like you're smiling. You want to weigh in? <laughs> sure. Um, my two cents as well. I think that the field of probiotic has a really advanced thanks to food-derived bacteria that have been leading the way into how we manufacture and produce these taxa. The, the challenge there in developing those CMCs is that food-derived bacteria, like a lactobacilli strain that you find in yogurt are usually more stable, easier to manufacture and scale up. Uh, so I think that one, we're thinking about that next generation probiotics or live biotherapeutics. Um, the challenge will be really the culturing piece, um, thinking beyond a single bacteria uh, similar to Mike, what Michael is doing and thinking more about communities. How do you culture these communities where each of them, and Michael can talk about this, of course, way better than I can, but how do you culture them uh, with where they have like each of them specialized needs? The other piece of information that will be important is that specifically for more vulnerable populations, the WHO has already uh, uh, given uh, guidelines where they ask for these products to be manufactured in GMP or clinical GMP facilities. That is not what's happening in with the majority of probiotics in the market right now. And this is really important because if you're giving a product to a baby, a vulnerable baby, a pregnant mother, um, or even a child, right? You want these products to be manufactured in clinical GMP or GMP facilities. And I think that those two are gonna be really important changes and shifts while also considering keeping costs down. Because the moment that you add GMP for manufacturing, the, the moment that you start specializing, um, using specialized sculpturing techniques, costs start going up. And then like the product no longer becomes available uh, for larger segments of the population. And let me, let me build on what Vanessa said and kind of reorient it for better about the microbiology here. Remember, you're growing these probiotics. You, you mentioned the dirty little secrets out here. So I'll give you one, which is not really a dirty little secret, but think about it. You're growing these bugs up in a fermenter, which is maybe 10,000 liters big. As you give in that inoculum into that media that's in 10,000 liters, those bugs are growing. They're going through more iterations, more evolutionary development and divisions than the human evolution easily over a 24 hour period. All you know at the end of the day with that probiotic is the genus and species of it. You have no idea if functionally that bug has changed going through all those divisions to get a nice full fermenter. So there, what I would say is needed to be done are functional assays of the bugs before you give them to the patients, not just knowing the genus and the species. Because one bug made in the Netherlands, one lacto, for example, fermented in for example, the Midwest over here will be different physiologically. And this is a huge problem in the veterinary sphere where we give probiotics to millions of chickens a year for inflammation and other things. I've had at meetings, people from companies who come up and say, why didn't my probiotic work for inflammation in these chickens? And we're to let millions of birds one time, then I got another lot in and it doesn't work. Then I got another lot in and it kind of works. I think we're going to find the same thing with humans if we don't get to what Vanessa was talking about and go beyond genus and species and say functionally, when we get this bug out of the fermenter and want to use it in a patient, do we know functionally it is doing what it will need to do? One uh, question. Were you going to answer this question? Uh, no, can I just add to Yes, please. Uh, about uh, probi uh, probiotics. So uh, 
Justin Sonneberg uh, has done beautiful work on promoting probiotics, not probiotics. So you're adding in fibers that you know will promote the beneficial bacteria to bloom and to reach a level that would confer uh, a protection. So a lot of people, they actually, they're not entirely lacking the beneficial bacteria. It's just that they don't have enough of those. So we already know what kind of nutrients are, are, are better to promote the expansion of those bacteria. So we can probably look into certain probiotics such as fibers that can be an alternative to really promote the abundance of those bacteria. And uh, Justin Sonneber also had a beautiful paper illustrating that uh, not just fibers, you can actually add uh, ferment, uh, fermenting bacteria um, at the same time that will help facilitate the digestion of the prebiotics in the intestine. That will actually maximize the benefits of the prebiotics. So that would be another thing to consider moving forward. Thank you. Um, so we have one uh, question on Slido, which is directed uh, to you, Melody. Um, it sure. says, uh, asks whether um, the has the colonic uh, 5-HT been measured? And uh, another question is whether any toxic effects have been observed at 20 to 40 um, micromolar of 5-HT. Um, so we garage the neonatal mice with that. I believe that those of the serotonin, we so far have not seen any uh, side effects as far as for uh, the immune cell response. Actually, we saw increased Tregs and reduced T17 cells. Uh, that's actually what we want to accomplish in the newborn's intestine so that they develop immune tolerance to dietary antigens and uh, commensal bacteria. Um, we do have... Uh, another study going on that's really based on this work. We asked the question of, now we know the bacteria, the unique, unique bacteria in babies are actually suppressing the MLA, which breaks down serotonin. So now what about the babies that have been exposed to antidepressants through the mom's breast milk? So the mom's taking antidepressants and then that can be transferred to the babies that would allow increased levels of the serotonin in the babies. But now we know babies actually having bacteria that would suppress the breakdown of serotonin. So that combination can actually increase the serotonin in babies so drastically that can actually potentially be cytotoxic. So that's what we're exploring now. Thank you. Um, so we we have now got- Can I ask one more question? Sure. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just can't help it, but I, I just, um, you know, the term food is medicine is taking on a, a whole new meaning. And uh, and perhaps this question is to Diego and to Mark, although others may want to weigh in as well. You know, with the work that's being done to identify novel chemosensory signals uh, that we, and the ligands and agents that can activate them and drive um, a variety of desires and um, and food signaling, um, and with our capacity to engineer food in a variety of different ways, whether through genetically modified foods or tissue engineered foods, um, do we have the the appropriate regulatory framework to understand, um, you know, potential um, modifications that may be taking place? Um, to dry food desire, as well as um, sometimes, you know, in well-intended effects uh, to derive a certain benefits from food. Um, I'm just wondering if, if you might be able to, to weigh on, on this. You know, we always thought it was sugar and salt and, and uh, you know, maybe a few other sort of factors that would uh, be in our food products. Uh, but as you alluded to, there are many others uh, apart from the whole world of colorants. But Diego, uh, is this something, you know, a lot of uh, GPCRs uh, that are orphaned, but are quickly, you know, going to fall out of orphan status. I'll jump in. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I cannot uh, help but to think of uh, the terminology that we colloquially use, like trust your gut. Uh, 
you know, now it has taken a whole new meaning because we use all of the senses, the eyes, the nose, the tongue, the ears, to find uh, food. But once we put it in the mouth and we swallow it, then we literally have to trust the gut. And over the last 30, 40 years, with the rise uh, of uh, food processing, we have been able to provide a type of skewed information to the gut. Like you will see broccoli with chicken flavor, uh, buffalo sauce, Cheerios, and so on and so forth. So essentially we're, what we're providing is misinformation to the gut and the gut, all it has to do is in, misinterpret that information and then drive certain desires, right? So I think that in terms of uh, regulation, there is a whole new arena in there. Uh, we just did not know what are the, intended, the, the, the unintended consequences of that. As a consequence, as a consequence uh, it's very clearly seen since that uh, appearance of uh, artificial sweeteners, obesity actually has gone up instead of going uh, down. So that's the first part of that, that point that I wanted to make. The second part is that now we are truly uh, feeding, you know, two organisms that have a common purpose, which is to eat. But uh, both microbes and the host need to eat. But the microbes cannot go to the grocery store; um, they they have to rely on the human. So the microbes are going to have to influence the human or the host to go and find that food. And we really need to understand how is it that those specific nutrients drive the behavior of those uh, uh, bacteria so they can guide our impulses. And specifically to the work that, a little bit of the summary of the work that I presented to you, what is fascinating is that from meal to meal, the amount of flagellin that is shed by the microbes, uh, it, it seems to fluctuate. And uh, they respond to the food in general, and uh, they shed the flagellin, and the flagellin is what regulates the amount of food that we eat over time. But obviously, uh, one main question in there is uh, different types of food perhaps will cause different types of shedding, and that just for like those microbes that have flagellin, right? Uh, so certainly, uh, the microbes have the awareness of the nutrients that we are ingesting, and they are able to influence uh, the body. So I think that those, those two components are gonna go uh, side by side to be able to tackle uh, disorders of the gut and uh, disorders of the brain because both are tightly linked to you know, IBS and IBD. They have a strong component of uh, mental health issues. And when you talk about your question really that you asked is really touches on the whole field of functional foods. Functional foods has been out there for many, many decades. <laughs> As you, Vanessa, nodding your, nodding your head. So you can go to the, the, the market or go on the web and see you can buy L-DOPA infused bread, how to make it. That's well known. Uh, treatments for Parkinson's in the third world, since they can't afford Cinemet, they go after mucuna beans because they grind them up. And there's uh, recipes for doing that, incorporating into your food and eating things like fermented foods. Fer fermentation of foods goes back centuries that if you ferment, what, what is sauerkraut good for? Well, sauerkraut is choline. What do you make in sauerkraut? Acetylcholine. And then you start eating it. So what are those effects of these functional foods uh, as you eat them? And in my own experience, one thing I did, because I was interested in all the bacteria that are in yogurts, for example, I once spun down a lot of yogurts from different manufacturers, and I found a plethora of different neurochemicals and neurotransmitters at very large quantities in our common yogurts. So functional foods is a whole realm that can be exploited in a, very much in a way that Diego was, was talking about. Thank you so much. Um, well, in the interest of, of time, um, we want to thank all of our speakers and uh, for such an interesting discussion today, and we'll certainly continue this on in the next uh, two sessions. Um, we are going to take uh, about a 25-minute break for lunch, um, not an hour, uh, and we'll come back here at 1.45 one, uh, uh, Eastern time. Thank you. And it brings us back to some of the initial summary that um, Elliot made this morning 
about what we want to look for in the next five to 10 years of, of the gut brain access research and, and new technologies. And two of the things that were mentioned by Elliot in the summary will be touched on in this session. One of them is uh, therapeutics and advances in therapeutics uh, using uh, the gut brain access. And the other is on new methods to be able to understand and coordinate and, and measure connections between the gut and the brain. We have three speakers. Uh, Todd Coleman, who is the chair of this workshop, is, is our first speaker from Stanford. Our second speaker is Hubert Lind from Minnesota. And our third speaker is, is Stuart Campbell from Axial Therapeutics. When I was also thinking about the title of this session and its topic, it reminded me of, of work that was published in the history of neuroscience in the autobiographical form from a former professor of mine at Berkeley, Marion Diamond. She was uh, known for her work in neurobiology and neuroanatomy specifically, and neuroplasticity. And she summarized her body of work uh, very succinctly um, by describing that she identified a five, or broadly the field had identified five different domains and key factors that are critical for brain health. And the first one she mentioned was diet. And of course, all the speakers um, in, in the sessions in, in, in yesterday and today have spoken a bit about its relevancy. And I wanna think, have every one of us think about what the four others are. I think they're gonna come up in our discussion. The other thing that she mentioned in her autobiography was a summary of some work that's been done, had been done at the time in um, the, how the immune system affects uh, the brain. And what this topic will also come up in this discussion as well. What she didn't have, and she unfortunately passed away, she uh, passed away in, in 2017 at the age of 90. So, but at the time that she was doing her research, she didn't have access to the technologies that will be shared and the coming technologies we're gonna be seeing. And this uh, next session kind of gives you a preview of, of what to expect in the coming years. So I'd like to really uh, then turn it back to, our, to or turn it to our speakers. And our first speaker again is Todd Coleman. Let me give you a little bit of background and context to um, where uh, Todd is coming from. Todd is an associate professor in the Department of Biomedic Bioengineering at Stanford University, and his research is extremely multidisciplinary. He uses tools from applied probability, and bioelectronics, and synthetic biology. And since 2020, uh, 2012, he has served as a scientific advisor for the National Academies specifically in the domains of science and entertainment and ex exchange. Uh, he has um, also been uh, uh, serving as a steering committee member for the National Academy's Keck Future Initiatives on Collective Behaviors from Cells to Societies. And he has been selected as a National Academy of Engineering Gilbert Lecturer, a TEDMED speaker, and a fellow of the American Institute for Biomedical and uh, Medical and Biological Engineering. He received his bachelor's degree in electrical engineering and computer engineering from the University of Michigan. And then he went on to receive his master's and PhD in, uh, at MIT in electrical engineering. He did his postdoc research at MIT in neuroscience. Todd, I'm turning it over to you. Look forward to your talk. Uh, thanks so much. Can everyone hear me? Uh, I hope that's a yes. Can hear you. Yes? Yes, and we see your first slide. Okay, great. And so, uh, as was mentioned, I did my PhD in electrical engineering, and then I did a uh, postdoctoral study in neuroscience. And so you see the perspective that I have, it comes from electrical engineering, neuroscience, and also technology development. So um, I, I got interested in the digestive system because my uh, I was doing brain science research, and then my dad passed away from pancreatic cancer in 2011. And uh, I, uh, it turns out he lost his mom to stomach cancer. So I began to develop an interest in the digestive system. Uh, at first glance, I um, didn't know much about it. One of the things I learned though is that the common symptoms of pain, nausea, bloating, constipation can give rise to many uh, of these different conditions. And so it's not surprising why, uh, you know, it's the second most common reason that someone misses school or work after a common cold. Um, uh, with a huge annual burden and cost. So uh, when I began to look at what role can I play as an electrical engineer slash brain scientist, uh, I, when I began to discover that we actually have pacemaker cells in our digestive system, just like we have in our heart, and they are connected electrically uh, to our, our, our brain via things like the vagus nerve and the, and the spinal cord, I began to be very intrigued. Uh, you know, a little bit more about this, you know, in case uh, you people don't remember, is that when you're in a very calm state where there's parasympathetic activity, uh, your heart rate slows down, you breathe more uh, calmly, and that actually activates your digestive system. And when you're in a stress out state with your sympathetic nervous system, 
uh, the opposite occurs. This is a you know a very high level sort of explanation. So one of the things that's become an interest with GI problems is that you can imagine that the engine of the car is not operating correctly, meaning maybe there's something wrong with your digestive system, or maybe the connection between the brain and the gut, like the gas pedal via, via the vagus or the brake pedal via the sympathetic nervous system is off. We don't know that at first glance by just looking at symptoms. So a high level idea that I got interested in is, well, what if we can take a look at what the EKG has done for the heart and try to do something analogous for the digestive system? So uh, unfortunately, the, um, the, uh, the technologies that have been developed to try to place electrodes over the abdomen that were first pioneered in the 1980s uh, had, uh, were subsequently deemed as having doubtful clinical usefulness. And so we call them the Rodney Dangerfield of electrophysiology. Uh, but I'm originally from Dallas, Texas, and in the spirit of the Dallas Cowboys and the Dallas Mavericks, being a maverick and still beginning to pursue uh, exploring this. So to make a long story short, we revisited what had been developed in the 1980s and used modern signal processing and modern technology development. We were able to place multi-electrode arrays over the abdomen to capture electrical activity from the digestive system. We can uh, uh, determine the direction that waves are propagating, uh, for instance. And with that information, we're able to look at, take a look at normal control patients versus patients uh, with digestive disorders. And here we're focused on the stomach. And in a normally operating digestive system, the contraction should propagate towards the small intestines, which we found basically in controls. And in patients with delayed gastric emptying, we saw a lot of sporadic uh, types of patterns. And so we were able to demonstrate, uh, those was the first demonstration of a non-invasive measure of gastric function that uh, basically correlates with the severity of symptoms. So on the horizontal axis, you have the percentage of slow waves that are deemed abnormal, not propagating towards the small intestines. And on the vertical axis, you have a clinically indicated symptom score about the severity of symptoms. We were able to go one step further and uh, be able to showcase that when, this, uh, when the symptoms exceed what we predict from a measurement of the engine, that was consistent with doctors using non-engine-based approaches to treat the condition, meaning suppose that the doctor subsequently went along and tried to treat the patient for depression or for something else, then in those situations, the symptoms resolved further sort of confirming that this technique can actually be used to disambiguate the, uh, the, the engine from the gas pedal, from the brake pedal. Uh, we got interested in uh, going in bi-directional fashions and saying, well, suppose there is a problem with the engine, how can we correct the engine? And so we were able to develop some wireless pacing techniques, borrowing ideas from cardiology, and ensure we can place pacing devices uh, uh, um, uh, uh, right into the stomach the, the, and you can wirelessly transduce them uh, cutaneously and we can actually uh, uh, entrain the slow wave of the stomach. And if you see where this red vertical line is, if you look at basically before uh, the red vertical line, before we did the pacing versus afterwards, we are entraining the, the activity of the stomach toward the target direction. So uh, we wanted to go one step further and uh, actually trying to build uh, miniaturize the measurement aspect of this. And so we were able to build some uh, portable devices that you can actually record for 24 hours uh, a day. And with this opportunity, this enables us to track uh, meals, responses to meals, track sleep, uh, bowel movements, et cetera. And one of the, the things that we found sort of unexpected was that uh, we know that one of the things that the heart and the digestive system share in common is that they're modulated uh, by the autonomic nervous system. So we focused on looking at sleep versus wake. And one of the things that we found is that we saw very structured patterns and controls of increased parasympathetic activity during sleep as compared to normal. Uh, whereas when we uh, look at patients uh, with, for instance, diabetic gastroparesis, if we look here at the balance between sympathetic and parasympathetic or sympathovagal balance, you see almost no change in the diabetic gastroparesis patients in sleep versus wake. And so uh, by combining sort of autonomic uh, measures of sleep versus weight, along with GI intensity scores and looking at meal responses, we're able to separate controls versus patients, as well as uh, gastroparesis with uh, sort of diabetic uh, versus non-diabetic patients who with gastroparesis or with not, with, uh, with, with, with remarkable accuracy. <clears throat> Now, uh, going one step further in trying to, to, to really miniaturize the measurement modalities, we wanted to, 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 to take it one step further to use these thin structural electronic uh, technologies. Uh, and we were able to do that. And basically, we were able to build some electrode arrays that you can 
locate uh, locate the position of the stomach with the portable ultrasound, then place almost imagine like a band aid over the abdomen and be able to track the type of information that I mentioned previously. Uh, another thing that we were able to do, uh, rather than indirectly looking at the autonomic nervous system in terms of heartbeat dynamics and sleep versus wake, could we actually try to directly pick up autonomic neural recordings? And so to make a long story short, we were able to pick up on uh, cervical autonomic neural, stru uh, neural structures, such as the vagus, the sympathetic ganglia, and the carotid, bo uh, carotid body, both uh, in tasks associated with the cold pressure test, as well as the time respiratory challenge. And these are tasks that are well uh, well understood uh, uh, that, that initiate, initiate autonomic responses. And we were able to take a look at uh, uh, biotype specific changes in, in the firing uh, and looking at uh, different uh, cell types with clustering. So uh, everything I've talked about so far was uh, basically measuring one thing versus measuring another. And I had this epiphany that, well, there is this gut brain axis. Why not try to measure both things at the same time? So uh, part of my interest in this uh, was stymied by, um, um, there's a finding in 2017 by a group out of France that demonstrated that if you record the electrophysiology of the abdomen, as I've been describing previously, of the stomach, and in addition, you use uh, the magnetic version of EEG, uh, then you can actually uh, find that there is a coupling between the stomach and the brain that can be measured non-invasively. So for people who don't know, MEG is basically the magnetic equivalent of EEG. However, it's a very expensive, you know, million dollar uh, types of system, magnets, cooling, all these sorts of details. But the finding that was interesting was that the alpha band of the brain is actually coupled uh, to the phase. So the amplitude of the alpha band is coupled to the phase of the slow signal of the stomach. So uh, in region specific manners. So to make a long story short, we got interested in saying this is exciting. But if you take a look at where MEG locations are, there's two in California, for instance, one in San Diego and one at UC San Francisco. There's not even one at Stanford. In many states, as you can see here, wherever it's gray, there are basically no such scanners. So wouldn't it be nice if we could replace um, MEG with something like EEG? And could we still pick up this coupling? And to make a long story short, in a recent publication of ours, we can. On the bottom left, this demonstrates where we saw phase amplitude coupling between the stomach and the brain and what regions using the magnetic. And uh, on the right, uh, basically, you can see analogous information with our study in EEG. So, you know, one of the things that we got interested in is, well, what underlies this coupling? So starting to take a look at some of the anatomy and whatnot. Well, we know that the, you know, the, the stomach, for instance, and the enteric nervous system get connected to the brain via um, uh, areas in the brainstem, like the a nucleus uh, tractus solitaris uh, and the dorsal nucleus of the vagus. And interestingly, uh, you know, the, the, the afferent information, the key cortical area that gets engaged is the insula. And then there's a, a recent finding in 2020 that showed that from a, you know, an efferent perspective or, or, or top down, the main cortical source of descending control to the stomach is, again, the insula. So, you know, thinking about, well, what's the story on the insula? Well, it's a very, very interesting brain structure. Here's a 2007, you know, story from the New York Times about it. And the high level idea is that it's tied to social emotions, loss and disgust, empathy and atonement. A uh, um, uh, very interesting brain structure. Uh, more importantly, it's, it's implicated in this notion of, you know, we have exteroception, which is like basically our, our ability to perceive external types of information. But what about our internal organs or the notion of interoception of, of perceiving the body's internal state? The main cortical area involved in that is the insula. And interoception has picked up a lot of attention clinically because of its, uh, its, 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 its going wrong or going awry is implicated in things like drug addiction, alcoholism, anxiety, Parkinson's disease, eating disorders, et cetera. And one of the main measures to determine interoception is uh, 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 one of them is called the water load test, which is used clinically with, with eating disorders. And we learned about, you know, satiation before in, in the talk uh, uh, previously. And so the high level idea is you tell someone to drink until they feel satiated and you measure the amount of volume of water that they drink. Then you tell them to drink again and drink more until they feel full. The high, deal, the high level idea is that if you have good gastric interoception, then the, ex, the, the exceeding amount associated with being full should be very small. Being full and being satiated should be similar, which means that the ratio of satiation volume as compared to satiation volume plus the, you know, the additional amount for full, that ratio should be near one if you have good interoception versus if you don't. So this is, you know, a measure that's been validated uh, clinically. 
And we got interested in determining, uh, is there a, a physiologic measure of interoception? For instance, what if we did simultaneous gut brain measurements? It was determined that there's this phase amplitude coupling between the stomach and brain. Uh, what happens if, um, you know, can that, is that at all associated with this behavioral measure? So just this past summer, we did some studies along those lines and we basically were able to, you know, we were the very small number of, you know, of the subjects, this is still very early on, that the behavioral measure of gastric interoception appears to associate with this physiologic measure of interoception. And you can envision how this could begin to get very interesting because of all sorts of ways of doing neuromodulation. So to basically conclude, um, you know, I talked about, you know, first extracting electrical patterns of the stomach and not invasively with an emphasis on spatial patterns because they correlate with symptom severity. Uh, I demonstrated, you know, some work that we, we, we've done on actually a wireless uh, pacing to train spatial patterns of the stomach. And one thing to remember that's interesting is that we know that the stomach and the brain are connected. So envision in some situations, pacing the stomach to not only treat the stomach, but possibly to treat brain structures. Uh, we demonstrate an ability to extract both indirectly uh, via uh, heartbeat dynamics, uh, information about autonomic function in sleep versus wake before or after meals and to subtype GI disorders. But also we demonstrated with the with advent of novel structural electronic technologies to not only pick up gastric electrophysiology um, uh, more obtrusively, but to get direct measures of autonomic function in particular cervical neuronal structures. And then lastly, the thing I talked about is our recent works in developing approaches to simultaneously measure the stomach and brain and how they, they co-vary with one another, uh, and, and in particular focusing for the moment within the topic of interoception. Uh, so, so sort of moving forward, what are interesting ways to, to think about how this relates to what other people are talking about? Well, we're going to hear from Hubert soon about the, the, the immune axis and whatnot. And a, a couple of things that I would like to highlight is that we know that the immune axis and the microbiome are interconnected. And it turns out that the microbiome uh, is connected to some of the stuff that I talked about with the gastric electrophysiology through short chain fatty acids um, uh, and a lot of the, the, these regulatory mechanisms of how when glucose gets too high or too low, it actually sends feedback signals from the stomach, from the uh, small intestines back to the stomach. So one can envision in the future by doing things like measuring the gut microbiome, measuring hormonal signals, understanding the immune axis, along with electrophysiology, we can see how these different pieces of a puzzle all come together. Uh, so with that, I, uh, I conclude my talk. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful talk, Todd. Uh, in the interest of time, we're going to go on to the next speaker, which is Hubert, and we'll save questions for Todd to the end with our discussion. Um, Hubert Lim is a professor in biomedical engineering and auto, uh, auto laryngology departments at University of Minnesota, and he was hired as an Institute of Technology neuroscience scholar. He currently holds the endowed uh, Lyons professorship, and he's also a co-director for the Center for Neuroengineering. He completed his bachelor's in uh, bachelor's of science in biomedical and bioengineering at UC San Diego, followed by a dual master's in biomedical engineering and electrical engineering and computer science and then a PhD in biomedical engineering at the University of Michigan. At the University of Michigan, his lab research focuses on neuroengineering, sensory neuroscience, neuroplasticity, and neuroimmune physiology, which he's gonna speak about at, at this meeting, including inflammatory conditions in, in collaboration with multiple clinicians and companies. He um, also is a, a chief scientific officer for two startup companies, Neuromod and Second Wave. Hubert. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction. And uh, thank you for the organizers, uh, also the committee members for um, inviting me to speak here and, and organizing this meeting. Um, I am not a brain, oh, someone say, oh, okay. Uh, I am not a brain gut uh, scientist, uh, and but I've learned a lot being at this meeting. Uh, where I, I think I can fit in is I, I currently work on um, modulating through the vagus nerve pathway to the spleen. Uh, for immunomodulation. Uh, originally, I'm a hearing scientist, so you can see I'm coming from a bit different topic. Uh, but I think the technologies that we're using, particularly ultrasound, to modulate the nervous system and end organs could be uh, potentially beneficial or could be a, a, a unique tool that could be leveraged uh, in humans, but all animals as well, uh, for uh, probing the gut-brain axis. So I, I think that's where I, I can help fit into this discussions or these discussions. Um, 
Uh, it was already mentioned, I have disclaimers, uh, you know, part of two companies. I won't speak about the first one, which is a tinnitus hearing company, and the second one, there is uh, financial interest and equity. I will talk about that topic uh, related to second wave systems and, of course, the funding sources that uh, have been generous, uh, generous to support this. Um, I, I just want to start here. Uh, I, I know we're going to, we're talking about the brain and we'll come back, you know, down to the end organs. Uh, it's just been an exciting time. Uh, you know, I, I started in cochlear implant field, uh, but there's just so many uh, novel technologies coming about with brain machine interfacing implants, uh, you know, from Parkinson's tremors, uh, depression treatments with deep brain stimulation. Uh, you have visual prosthetics, uh, spinal cord stimulators, and, and what you heard from Dr. Kevin Tracy, vagal nerve stimulation. And there's a lot of opportunities there. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, being able to get specificity, that's great. You can interface with that nerve. Uh, one of the challenges, though, is that it is invasive, and being able to probe uh, or interface with a lot of patients or a lot of individuals, especially for science investigations, it becomes a bit challenging. On the flip side, you have non-invasive technologies, and you've got things like transcranial magnetic stimulation, which creates magnetic fields, uh, can activate the nervous system, not only the brain, but in the body. Uh, you got old school uh, current stimulation, right? Transcranial or body stimulation like TENS devices. Those are great in terms of accessibility, right? Large scale use, but then on the flip side, they lack the focused ability, right? So this is why ultrasound has become such a hot topic in the last 10 years, because it's kind of achieving the best of both worlds. You're gonna get ultrasound with you know, beams that can be narrow, but even using many transducers, kind of like surround sound, you know, TV uh, with your speakers, you can focus in where you're sitting. You can do that also with ultrasound, cancel things out and beam form into regions, into the skull, into the body, uh, and it's non-invasive. So this becomes very exciting. Uh, it can be for the nervous system in the brain, peripheral nerves, potentially, and, and organs. Now, the big question is with all this excitement, does it work? And I spent about the last seven years of uh, discovering what can work, what can't work, a lot of other colleagues of, of mine also. And just the take home message is that um, with ultrasound, at least of nerves and neurons, uh, it's not causing strong like action potentials, but uh, multiple groups are showing that you can modulate cells, depolarize cells. And there's other literature showing that you can uh, uh, perturb non-neural cells as well. So this gives you an opportunity now that you can look into different ways of probing the, the system, even in a modulatory way, uh, to, to control function, right? Uh, there's a lot of um, research has been done. This is just some animal, I, you know, because I'm trying to tour the force here with ultrasound, what's going on to bring you up to speed. But I just put some of these in. If you're interested, you can look them up. Uh, some of the early seminal studies in animals. Uh, there's been a lot of studies in humans already. So <laughs> humans, ultrasound of the brain, ultrasound of the body, uh, and they're using parameters that are typically within the diagnostics, you know, safety limits. So we're talking about um, using parameters, lower frequencies, you know, few hundred kilohertz to maybe low megahertz and pressures that you're looking at at few hundred uh, kilopascals, maybe up to megapascal. So if, if you look those up, uh, but generally speaking, they, they're within the safe limits and you can change the different parameters and pulse patterns, right? Um, one thing though is with all this excitement and we didn't intend to find this, uh, we found out that there was a lot of confounding factors. Um, you couldn't excite um, neurons directly with action potentials easily. You can modulate, but we also found that the ultrasounds activating the skin and vibrating the skulls. The cerebrospinal fluid in your brain is connected to the fluids in your cochlea. So when you vibrate the fluid, you actually cause hearing with ultrasound, uh, which is interesting when you cause vibrations of your fluid. So there was a lot of um, confounding factors that we discovered, but when you remove those, for example, we deafened the animals in these studies, um, and then you could see what, what could be potentially modified or, or, or modulated. And this was not just our group, um, the collaborators, Dr. Mikhail Shapiro and Doris Chow over at Caltech uh, independently found similar, similar effects. Um, another paper that was interesting, and I'm going to show you a couple of different studies very quickly. Uh, Dr. Mikhail Shapiro at Caltech, he did a beautiful study with his lab where, you know, we're trying to get the mechanism, what's actually happening. And it may not be causing action potentials per se. Uh, if there are like a piezoelectric or kind of mechanical channels, sensitive channels, you can vibrate those and activate neurons or, or cells. Um, but it, it appears that what's going on is 
that when you cause a mechanical perturbation of the membrane, there is some calcium influx, one mechanism of it, that then kind of amplifies other channels to open, eventually becomes uh, voltage-gated channels that, that cause not necessarily spiking, but at least depolarization, and maybe could lead to spiking depending on the ongoing activity. So this is one, one mechanism that has been shown uh, by their group. There's a few others. Uh, the other thing I want to point to, just so you're aware, is that there's already been 20 to 30 years of research uh, before a lot of this hype in neuro where uh, people were doing non-neural cells, right? So chronocytes, stem cells, endothelial cells, um, and they have been showing similar parameters around one megahertz, uh, some of the similar uh, pressures that you could, uh, you know, activate integrin receptors or other, you know, mechanic, mechanosensitive sensor, uh, receptors and so forth. So this uh, shows that on the modulation excitation side, there's a lot of potential. Um, now, if you increase the intensity a bit, you can actually, and in longer durations, you can cause, uh, you know, right at the border of thermal, you don't want to do too much thermal because then you can actually cause lesions. But if that fine region, if you can use a thermal mechanism, you can actually shut down neural activity uh, or ongoing activity, uh, not only in the brain, uh, but we also showed that this is possible with nerves. Um, and I'm bringing this up because uh, later as we get to end organ modulation, it helps us to define what's actually being activated. Uh, it's not easy to cause action potential nerves, but potentially you can modulate um, neurotransmitter release from axon terminals by depolarizing them, but also on receptors. So let's jump here. This, this is the part, you know, hopefully background was helpful for neuro, ultrasound neuromodulation of the brain and peripheral nerves. But this is where I, I got quite excited. Uh, really, it stemmed from the seminal work uh, Dr. Kevin Tracy already presented, uh, where you have this uh, vagus nerve pathway to the spleen, and you can drive an anti-inflammatory effect. And the question is, is that that pathway, can we access it non-invasively directly by stimulating the nerves and the end organ, the spleen, uh, to modulate or control the immune system? And uh, this was already covered by Dr. Tracy. Uh, you, you know, it's, it's clear, becoming more clear now that there is a bi-directional communication of the brain with the immune system. And particularly one of that, one of those pathways is this brain through the salient ganglion to the spleen. And uh, one of the pathways here you see is uh, release of norepinephrine, activates the T cells, a cholinergic pathway there that then causes the immune cells or macrophages and immune cells to kind of the breaks that uh, Dr. Tracy was talking about that could shut down this hyperinflammation. Uh, what got me very excited was this uh, 2016 paper that was already shown that in actual patients uh, who are getting vagus nerve implants, they're able to show this reduction in TNF, um, IL-6, and some other inflammatory uh, uh, cytokines or biomarkers. So we uh, set out to do an experiment in uh, rodents. Um, what was interesting is this was DARPA funded and we are doing it independently, but GE, uh, Dr. Chris Puglio and a team there also with the Feinstein group with Dr. Kevin Tracy's group there, they were doing research independently. We didn't know about them. We were connected by uh, Dr. Eric Van Giesen at DARPA who said, you got to share results because you're getting similar results, which is <laughs> encouraging. Um, and so we decided to do a companion paper. Uh, ours is in an inflammatory mice model uh, chronic or semi-chronic, and theirs is an LPS sepsis type of model, acute, uh, um, and they showed more uh, of mechanisms of action. The idea here is we took animals with inflammatory arthritis, we applied ultrasound, target ultrasound to the spleen, and the idea is to access this pathway that I, I talked about before uh, in the rodents, and you could see uh, hopefully the swelling of the ankles, you know, to represent the arthritis. Uh, Big team that was involved, uh, Dr. Bryce Binsett is, is a, M, one of the uh, MD-PhD co-directors at our university, has a beautiful model, mouse model for inflammatory arthritis. Um, and then we have other colleagues there. Medtronic was involved with this in the early stages as well. So this model, you basically take uh, this KBXN model of inflammatory arthritis, you take the serum uh, out and you inject it into animals and over very quickly in, in a, a period of days, the arthritis forms in the animal. It's not long lived. You got about 10 days. So you have to kind of time the experiments to, to track it within that, you know, maybe seven, eight day period. And you can measure the ankle thickness as well as, you know, uh, some clinical scores. So what we did is we took the animals, uh, this is ultrasound transducer at the top, and there's a cone. And the cone basically, uh, it, for most purposes, it's like a pointing device because we already characterized the beam. And the beam, uh, due to the curvature of the ultrasound transducer, helps the beam to be focused. And uh, the cone allows us to kind of pinpoint where that focus is. 
And we're able, the spleen is right underneath the skin in, in animals and in, in the rodents. In humans, it's underneath your ribs. So there are some uh, technologies that we have to develop for that. And we basically um, provide ultrasound over eight days. We provide the serum on uh, there. You can see day zero, uh, negative one. You know, we shave the animal, do ultrasound already. And then we uh, daily stimulation, in this case, two minutes up to 20 minutes. It depends on the protocol. Uh, and then we collect blood samples to do cytokine analyses um, and, and we track the animals. So just you know, quick summary, uh, encouragingly, what we found uh, was that we could reduce the ankle thickness. Uh, you know, they, Normally they would get swelling of their ankles. We we're able to reduce that uh, substantially. And also the clinical scores, which is more visual assessment of the joints in these, in these arthritic mice, uh, we're able to greatly reduce um, those using in this particular condition was one megahertz and very low, low intensity pressures, 350 kilopascals. But what was important for us was a dose response. So we did two minutes and then we did six, 12 and 20 minutes. And what happened was that we were able to further reduce the swelling, right? So change in ankle thickness, you want that small because it means that you're not you know, experiencing the swelling. And, and 20 minutes is what we then continue to use for clinical trials in the future. Um, this is what I really appreciate about uh, um, you know Kotera at all. This is the GE paper with Dr. Kevin Tracy. Is that they did quite a bit of controls and mechanistic studies and blockers of the of the of the you know uh, synapses here, and what they found. Uh, is there a mouse? Oh, well, I'll just explain it. Uh, so what you see there is they basically narrowed it down to this synapse here in their model. It wasn't all due to that, but when they blocked that interface there, most of the benefit disappeared. And so what could be happening is ultrasound, uh, as I mentioned, it, it, through our studies, it doesn't excite easily the axons, right? The nerves, we tried in every which way. Um, but uh, based on the study you saw from Caltech, uh, Dr. Shapiro's uh, group, uh, it is possible calcium influx or some kind of perturbation at the terminals that releases the neurotransmitters. The other side, as you saw with those papers, non-neural cell modulation, you could basically apply ultrasound to the receptors of the immune cells. Right, so that could be also what's happening. It could be one or both, uh, but the idea is then you can actually activate that synapse uh, as one part of it and cause that cascade for anti-inflammatory effect. So, um, does this work in humans? And this is where uh, we, we spend quite a bit of time uh, for the last three years uh, pushing forward different human studies. And because our device, we didn't have a device ready yet. The idea was potentially using a, a, a CART-based system that G had been using um, uh, for, for different studies. And, and this one actually was a study that was done by GE, Chris Puglio, and, and uh, Feinstein uh, group, where they um, uh, actually stimulate healthy subjects uh, of the spleen to see if you could kind of, their baseline cytokine levels, they could reduce it. And also we had some uh, RNA sequencing data in an ongoing rheumatoid arthritis study that we were able to pull that out while the study was still going to assess. And we decided to try to pull this together into a, a single paper that's on MedArchive. Uh, this study, basically what they did was they used a system that can image the spleen. Uh, that's the beauty of it, 100, I think 160 k device, but you know that's the beauty of it. You can basically image the, the, the device or the, the spleen, and then you can target and stimulate the spleen. And they only had to do it for three minutes. And when they did that for three minutes, they had those stimulated and those not stimulated. Then they took the blood samples out because it's in it's healthy subjects, the levels are low, but they mixed the serum with um, uh, LPS to kind of amplify the signal. And they're able to show that you had significantly uh, reduced inflammation, right? So less TNF uh, um, uh, release uh, response uh, for the stimulated case. So this was uh, you know inhuman subjects. Uh, we ran uh, or had a run a, a rheumatoid arthritis study using off-the-shelf device. Uh, due to COVID, it got delayed, but we just finished. Uh, we, we didn't get to 20, but we got to our, uh, all 20, but we got to 19. Uh, but what we were able to do was um, uh, look at the cytokines that um, were were uh, uh, modulated. And what we found was that, um, you know, for the RNA sequencing pathways, uh, IL-1 beta, IL-8, NF um, um, uh, kappa uh, B uh, and interferon gamma. gamma. Um, what was interesting at the time was COVID was happening. Uh, this is when we got the data and they were showing the, the opposite, right? For SARS-CoV-2, those with inflammation were having an increase in those cytokines. So that then uh, allowed us to go to um, DARPA and MCDC uh, uh, and different funding agencies uh, to see that if we could run um, uh, COVID studies in the hospitalized, you know, uh, in the hospital, with hospitalized patients to see if we could reduce their inflammation. And so we have that study that was run. Uh, we started with a GE device. Uh, we enrolled 30 uh, patients. 
Uh, we just are about to submit it, so I, I, I don't have it to share today, but um, it'll, I promise it'll be up, Med Archive, pretty soon. Uh, so you'll be able to take a look at that, and there's the clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, it was encouraging, so you know we're excited to share that with everyone when it's published. Um, we have an ongoing uh, rheumatoid arthritis study, and this is where my interests are with uh, second wave. We've developed um, a lower cost uh, of device that um, can be taken home, still needs some smartness into it, but you could see there the size of it, about the size of your hand, and it is placed over your ribs. It has some uh, smarts to be able to find the ribs and then stimulate between the ribs uh, to the spleen. And uh, we've uh, recruiting 15 patients. We've halfway done now. So hopefully in a few months, I'll be able to present these results to you as well. Uh, the other thing where I want to end on is just a few examples where um, it's been exciting to see that it's not just ultrasound of the spleen. There's opportunities for ultrasound of um, the spleen to affect other you know, applications or organs or conditions, but also ultrasound stimulation of other and organs or targets. And here, this is one of the uh, seminal you know, classic studies that happened early on was uh, Dr. Mark Akusa and his team. Uh, they basically uh, stimulated the spleen with ultrasound and they could actually see that they uh, helped uh, treat or you know, improve the condition with acute uh, kidney injury. Uh, they used the approach where they blocked the, um, the blood flow to the uh, kidneys and then you know, reperfusion. And then they uh, showed that you can reduce the inflammation, but also the damage associated with uh, ultrasound of the spleen. And they showed that the spleen was uh, necessary or uh, you know, necessary for this to happen. Uh, this, I have to give credit to Chris Puglio and the uh, GE team because uh, they have stimulated with ultrasound uh, a lot of different targets. Uh, they targeted the celiac ganglion um, or ganglia uh, for uh, looking at inflammatory bowel disease, and they showed that they could have um, improvements uh, uh, for condition related to IBD. Um, they've stimulated uh, the liver, they've stimulated the pancreas, and they stimulated uh, the intestine, uh, intestine region. Uh, and all of those, they've shown that you could modulate different biomarkers. Now, they predominantly focused on glucose and inflammatory markers, uh, but there isn't a reason why there couldn't be other uh, biomarkers that are modulated if those are. And you could see there, uh, you know, if you're interested, the two papers, a uh, uh, ni nice overview of what's going on and opportunities. I just want to end with this one because um, I I'm just always impressed with Chris and his team. Um, you know, they did a lot of animal studies, and then they moved to large animals. Uh, it was in uh, diabetic mice, rats, and then swine, but now they, they have a, a clinical trial running in diabetes patients using ultrasound of the liver. Um, and from what I understand, it's it's been encouraging. Uh, and hopefully those results are going to be presented, uh, you know, uh, sometime soon uh, as well. So with that, um, you know, the last bit is there are technologies, you know, we're developing technologies with the company Second Wave. Um, you know, uh, we've got non-significant risk determination, which is encouraging from FDA, so we can use them in humans. Uh, GE's been developing uh, portable, uh, you know, more miniaturized systems, and I think there's opportunities to leverage these technologies to probe the body. Uh, if you're interested, we did a podcast. Uh, this is just here, Chris, myself, and Mikhail Shapiro uh, with Arun and, and Scraps Jojo. Uh, they, they have this thing, if you're interested, in, uh, we talk about all these different uh, ultrasound areas. And with that, uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Herbert. We'll have time for a, question, or a few questions after the next speaker. Stuart Campbell is our next speaker. He is a CEO of Axel Therapeutics. He joined Axel Therapeutics in 2017 as VP of Research and Development. He has over 30 years or about 30 years of experience in biopharmaceutical areas, and he has he, um, obtained his uh, bachelor's and with honors in chemistry from St. Francis Xavier University, a PhD in organic chemistry from Queens University. And he did his postdoctoral work at Duke University. Uh, he's gonna share some of his new business development for Axial Therapeutics and some of the new technologies they have focusing on gut, the gut-brain access. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you very much. Thank you for the, the privilege to come and speak to everybody today. Um, I, I think what, um, Maybe we'll introduce Axial Therapeutics to you just very briefly and what our mission is. Uh, we've heard a lot these last two days about probiotics, uh, live biotherapeutics, consortia, and so on. And those are, are really promising approaches to addressing uh, issues and disorders uh, that uh, lie in the gut-brain axis in terms of etiology. Uh, we have a different approach. Uh, it's not better or worse, it's just different in that we um, really want to take a more traditional drug discovery approach 
to really look at the gut microbiome as a source of drug targets that we can uh, hit with small molecules in a variety of different disease indications. And so we're in the clinic. I'll tell you uh, uh, the autism story today. Uh, we are clinical stage. Our focus is in uh, neurological indications, autism and Parkinson's disease principally. Uh, again, the differentiator here is that all of our drugs are small molecules that target things in the gut, either microbes in the gut or the, something on the host side uh, at the gut microbiome interface uh, with the host. And so the key here is that our compounds need very little, if any, systemic absorption. They don't need to get to the brain. Uh, we think this imparts some advantages over uh, traditional CNS drugs, and that seems to be bearing out in our, in our clinical work. Uh, the way we go about this, we heard uh, so several really nice introductions to how uh, different groups approach uh, interrogating the gut microbiome and building model systems to ask certain questions or answer certain questions. Um, in particular, from uh, Michael Fishbach earlier today, went through a very nice uh, uh, sort of progression from uh, a full fecal matter transplant to a very reductionist system and then to a very controlled consortium. We, we do the first two uh, and um, that's, that's really helped us uh, get to therapeutics, um, but it's these reductionist systems that we think are particularly valuable for, for us uh, because I think it does accelerate getting things into the clinic. And so one of the other benefits of small molecules is once we've identified a development candidate, it becomes very familiar territory to uh, potential large pharma partners who are essentially going to foot the bill for uh, the large phase three studies and so on, uh, but also regulators are very familiar with this. And so we can remove some of those, um, I guess in a way self-imposed barriers or, or hurdles on um, getting this, this type of approach into the mainstream. And so what I'll talk about today is uh, the first two or three chapters of our journey on the autism uh, front. And it starts uh, more than a decade ago with work done by Elaine Shao, we heard from a lot yesterday, and Sarkis Mazmanian at Caltech, uh, and then since developed uh, further by uh, Sarkis Mazmanian's group at Caltech, and then more recently where we've collaborated with Sarkis to translate some of those basic science findings into the clinic. So we do have a, a pipeline that we're trying to build. So I won't talk about our Parkinson's work or oncology work today, but based on the same platform, which I think I'll use the autism program to illustrate, uh, is uh, we're, we're moving those uh, closer to the clinic. But I'll talk today about our clinical story in, in uh, autism with the molecule we call AB2004, uh, which I think it really, I hope will convince you that these types of basic science findings can be translated into the clinic. So I'll take a quick step back for a moment and just orient everybody on how we're approaching autism. Uh, I think autism touches a majority of people either directly in their family or their extended family. Uh, this is a very special population, incredibly diverse population. So it makes it really hard from a drug discovery point of view to know exactly how we can uh, phenotype or categorize certain patients in order to develop a therapy. Um, so we've, we've taken a little bit of a tangential approach in that we've focused on irritability associated with autism. And this is a pretty significant uh, problem. So most kids in their youth through to adulthood will uh, struggle with things like irritability and anxiety. And by irritability, I don't mean uh, someone's in a bad mood or a little bit edgy. What I mean is these are self-destructive behaviors, self-harm, destruction of property, tantrums, things that become increasingly difficult to manage. As kids get older, they hit puberty, they get uh, physically stronger. And so this really leaves families in a predicament, but also this, the people themselves, it, they have trouble going to school on a regular basis, and that obviously impacts them uh, long uh, throughout their entire life. There are two drugs approved for irritability associated with autism, aripiprazole or Abilify and Respiradone, both atypical antipsychotics. They work. They do calm the kids down, but that's they, they sedate the kids essentially. And so um, 
most families, when they put their child on an atypical antipsychotic for irritability, it's really trading the irritability symptoms for another set of symptoms that are easier for them to cope with. Um, it's not a really, uh, really a fair choice that these families have to make. And so our motivation here is to provide something where that choice becomes uh, much more agreeable. And so we go all the way back just to introduce you to how we got to where we are today is to a seminal publication by uh, Elaine Shaw and Sarkis Mazmanian back in 2013, where we heard earlier as well about the maternal immune activation model in mice, which um, is uh, from a face validity standpoint is representative of, of the risk associated with uh, a child developing autism if their mother is infected at a certain time during their, their during her pregnancy. Um, they modeled that in mice and thought that maybe the microbiome may be contributing to that because of the prevalence of GI symptoms in kids with autism. And what they found was by profiling all of the metabolomic uh, uh, composition in blood, uh, as well as what the microbiome was uh, comprised of and the behaviors. And they found in, um, in these mice that had the so-called autism-like symptoms that there were a number of small molecule metabolites circulating in the blood that were dysregulated. And the one that was the most dysregulated was this molecule that we call 4-EPS. It's 4-ethylphenyl sulfate. It comes from uh, tyrosine metabolism by the gut microbiome. So they did a very important experiment here. So and the, on the face of it, maybe this 4-EPS molecule could be a biomarker of some kind of clinical phenotype. Um, and that was very exciting in and of itself. But the very important experiment that they did was to actually take synthetic 4-EPS and inject it daily into wild-type mice. And they were able to induce a very profound anxiety phenotype in these mice. It didn't impact social interaction or repetitive behavior, some of these other sort of core symptoms we associate with autism, but it did actually impact uh, the anxiety phenotype. And so this was an example of how a dysregulated metabolite has its own pharmacology. It wasn't clear at that time whether it was acting in the brain or somewhere else uh, systemically or what it was doing. And so that led to chapter two, which was to really understand first is this 4-EPS molecule a mouse curiosity or is it actually present in people? And so we published uh, this paper last year in biological psychiatry where we profiled about 100 kids with autism against uh, their match control peers. And we did full-blown metabolomics in blood and urine. And what we found was, much to our surprise and delight, was that the molecule 4-EPS was one of the most dysregulated metabolites in the entire data set. And it, in fact, uh, has a strong association with, with uh, phenotype and also with uh, GI symptoms as well. So this was the first indication that perhaps uh, what was shown in mice might actually have some relevance in humans, but we're a long way. This is still just a correlation. and so. To get to the bottom of this correlation versus causation, we go to this middle scenario that Michael Fishbach pointed out earlier, this really reductionist, admittedly very contrived system. But our goal here is to use different technologies to isolate variables from a very complex ecosystem of the microbiome interfacing with the host and design a system where we can turn on or off a very specific feature and then look at the behavior, look at the uh, tissue response to the presence or absence of a metabolite. So briefly, what, what was done here was germ-free wild-type mice were colonized with two microbes. And in the 4EP plus case that you see on the right-hand side, a little mouse, uh, is the two microbes combine to constitutively produce 4EP, 4 ethylphenol, which is the precursor to 4EPS. 4-EPS is formed in the liver after it's absorbed. Um, as a control group, same two microbes, just with the last steps of the 4-EP biosynthesis engineered out. So what we show here is that the mice that have the competent microbes actually produce a lot of 4-ethylphenyl uh, sulfate, and that 4-ethylphenyl sulfate shows up in the brain. So this allows us to maybe now 
behavior test and look at all of the brain tissue and, and test various functions in these animals to see exactly what 4-EPS is doing. And so um, this was published in, in Nature uh, in February of this year from Sarkis's group at Caltech uh, with Brittany Needham, who's now uh, an independent researcher at University of Indiana. And what, what they showed was that chronic exposure to 4-EPS by making 4-EP via the gut microbiome uh, led to a strong communication phenotype and a strong anxiety phenotype. Um, and so the, this was really the first demonstration that more natural exposure to these metabolites and then toggling them off with the control group, we could actually see differences in behaviors. So the question here is what's going on and how might we build an intervention based on what we, we learn? So what was done in this study is a lot of work. I'll just show you one slide here on, on really what the, I think the take home message is, is that 4-EPS when it enters the brain, it actually arrests oligodendrocyte maturation. It halts oligodendrocyte maturation at the precursor stage. And as you can see the graph on the uh, bottom left, that the total number of oligodendrocytes in the whole pool doesn't change from one group to the next but the number of mature myelinating oligodendrocytes is increased in the, in the metabolite exposed group, the 4EP plus group. And you see that uh, in the fax images on the top right and also on the bar graph on the top left. And so what this suggests is that 4EPS is not inherently toxic. It simply has a regulatory function in, um, in, in impacting the ability of oligodendrocyte precursor cells to mature to mature oligodendrocytes that can make myelin. Now what we've done is shown that 4-EPS actually downstream impacts the myelination capacity of the brain. And this is a very uh, region specific. There's uh, brain function and, and um, MRI images in the brain to show changes in connectivity and function in specific regions of the brain that are closely associated with emotional regulation. And so, with that understanding, we said, well, how are we gonna intervene here? What can we do? We could target the brain, but we still don't know exactly what 4-EPS is doing. We don't know the target in the brain yet. We really wanna understand that. But if the culprit are these uh, metabolites uh, and they're being produced exclusively in the gut, why don't we just sequester them in the gut and have them ushered out in the stool? Um, taking that approach actually uh, separates us from knowing, needing to know, exactly which microbes are making it. And I think what we learned uh, or saw earlier today and yesterday was that there's a lot of functional redundancy in the microbiome. So the idea of targeting the microbes that make it, it's not one. This is a very common um, biosynthetic pathway in Clostridia. And so the idea of actually knocking that function out of the microbiome is a pretty tall order. So let's not bother with that. Let's just take the metabolites out once they're produced. And that formed the basis of uh, AB2004, which is a non-absorbed sequesterant molecule, take it orally, travels through the GI, passes in your stool, and it picks up these metabolites along the way. And so we went back into our mouse model. We put this uh, sequesterant in the food. And what we showed was that we could in fact rescue the anxiety phenotype and the repetitive behavior phenotype by treatment with the AB2004 which reduces the 4-EPS or 4-EPS levels systemically by reducing the 4-EP levels in the gut. So we could have paused here and done a lot more preclinical work to really understand exactly what's happening in the brain. And, and what we thought was, we have a very safe molecule here. Let's put it in people. Let's go to where it really counts. And so we did an open label dose escalation study in adolescents with autism. We were lucky enough to get this study completed uh, in March of 2020. Um, we were lit I was literally coming back from Australia, uh, being asked if I had been in uh, China uh, recently uh, because they were worried about the uh, coronavirus coming into the US. So we literally you know, came in at the wire on this one. And one of the things that we did here was we were very cognizant and um, we had a, a discussion about it uh, earlier about whether 
Um, we can trust animal models. How translationally relevant are the endpoints we measure? And we had that same concern. So going into this study, I talked about the anxiety phenotype and the re repetitive behavior phenotype in the mice. We don't know how that's going to translate into the human condition. So we measured a lot of things, a lot of different ways, because if there was a signal there, we wanted to see it. And if we saw the signal, we could down select for future clinical trials and really hone in on an indication. And so um, as we expected, the drug was incredibly safe. It was a, a 30 patient or 30 subject trial uh, done in three sites in Australia and New Zealand. And um, yeah, so no surprises there. That was great to see. And what was really exciting was that we did see significant reductions in a host of structurally related metabolites that share a lot of common features with 4EP and 4EPS. So paracresol sulfate, indoxyl sulfate, et cetera. And we expected that, it was really great to see. But what was really nice to see also was that uh, we saw uh, significant changes in a several endpoints, most uh, predominantly in irritability, which you can't really measure in a mouse, and anxiety. So we actually saw some translational um, value here between the mouse and the human, uh, at least at a face level. And what we saw was that the irritability scores came down. And uh, between the end of treatment, the EOT, and the recovery period four weeks later, the metabolites shot back up and the irritable behavior began to return. So um, the nice part here, another added feature is that the fact that the metabolites rebounded to baseline levels after removing the drug implies, we need to prove this, but it implies that the uh, microbiome is not undergoing a significant alteration by virtue of being exposed to the drug. So the irritability signal was particularly interesting because uh, there's a clear regulatory path. So we, we, when we think in industry about how to get something approved, irritability isn't the end of the story, but it's maybe how we get this drug onto the market and helping kids because the FDA understands this indication. We understand how to get a drug through there. And so there's, again, it's about removing risks and barriers to getting a drug approved. So currently we are in the middle of a placebo controlled phase two study, uh, US, Australia, New Zealand, with the primary endpoint being change in irritability at eight weeks of treatment. Uh, we plan to read that study out at the end of 2023. Uh, and so this is now, I guess, chapter four of this story, and I hope it's a long book. So um, I'd like to thank all the great collaborators that we have. We have a very close relationship with Sarkis and his lab uh, and a really dedicated and talented team at, uh, at Axial, as long with, along with um, very uh, strong investment group as well. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Stuart. So we have a few minutes left for questions. I want to start off with one that's broader that um, I hope each one of the speakers could address. One question is how translatable is your work that you're studying the relative to microbes, perhaps in the gut or in the spleen, which Hubert mentioned, to other tissues and their effects on the brain. Uh, as, an, as as Todd, would you be able to speak to the measurement tools you're using, how relevant those are? And Stuart, would you be able to speak towards whether there's known information about how AB400 affects other tissues? I'm thinking more like the vasculature and, and uh, skin and other uh, completely other tissues. Todd, please go ahead. Okay, great. So <clears throat> you were interested in understanding the translatability. So I, you know, I talked about the stomach electrophysiology monitoring. Uh, you know, what what we're picking up there is uh, these pacemaker cells called the Cajal cells, uh, and they actually are throughout the GI tract. So you could, in principle, pivot from the stomach to places like the small intestines or the colon. What's also interesting is that the inherent frequency uh, uh, changes in different parts of the GI tract. So in the stomach, it's 0 0.05 hertz, and small intestines, it's 0 0.18 hertz. So in principle, it's there. There are some anatomy issues that make it a bit more challenging because of how the direction of the digestive system orients. Uh, but the, you know, the, the, the principle is there. Um, so that's one way this can be translated to other areas. You know, as I mentioned, we're also measuring the electrophysiology of the brain, with EEG, doing these things in tandem. And we also demonstrated just recently 
the ability to pick up cervical, you know, neuronal structures indicative of things like the vagus and the sympathetic nerve. So um, I hope that's helpful. Uh, does that address your question, do you think? It does. Stuart, would you be able to comment as well? Sure, thank you. Uh, as I mentioned, in our case, uh, we believe that these microbial metabolites, at least these this class that we're, we're investigating, um, since they're, they seem to have an effect on myelin plasticity and myelination capacity, that's a pretty fundamental process. So um, we anticipate that uh, these metabolites uh, uh, could be evaluated in other uh, mood disorders, depression, schizophrenia, et cetera. Obviously, we'd have to do all the, the, the basic science work to show that they're they're altered in those populations, or at least that uh, those people with those conditions are more sensitive to the certain levels of those metabolites. Uh, it doesn't mean that the AB2004 approach, that sequestration approach is going to work every time, but I think that there's uh, we're just at the tip the front end of understanding the role of these circulating metabolites in, in um, neurological conditions. Thanks, Stuart. And Hubert, could you follow up briefly on the different tissues that you're studying with ultrasound or neuromodulation? Yeah, and, and, and actually, uh, uh, Todd, as you're speaking, you know, obviously ultrasound can uh, potentially modulate different cells and different organs, um, uh, but always it's kind of the targeting question. I mean, we can beamform and you got to, know that you're actually hitting the target. Uh, so I think there's opportunities where it can hit different cells and, and organs. But even a question back to you, Todd, is, you know, is the approach of uh, recording these neurophysiological signals, are they localized enough? Can you do like kind of uh, EEG where you source localize the different organs? Because I think that's where getting to your question, Mina, is basically if we could track where we're pointing to and have a biomarker to say that we're actually modulating even the gut I always I wonder if that could be something pretty exciting. Uh, so maybe that could be one option, Todd. And if you have any comments about how localized you can be on the sensing side. So uh, it's great you mentioned that, Hubert. So we actually have an active NIH grant on that, and we already have one publication on that. So we've already demonstrated you, with my student, demonstrated with my student that we can perform the source, source localization using analogous methods to EEG. One thing that's easier is that there's not a skull there, actually. Uh, that's the good news. The bad news is that the digestive organs move around a lot. And this actually leads to a question I have for you, Hubert, is that I saw in the GE work, they were using all those detailed imaging to stimulate. And I guess that's in part because these organs are moving. And I'm curious to what extent does that um, affect your approach uh, given the dynamic you know, movements that occur? <clears throat> yeah, for the spleen, we've been fortunate because uh, between the ribs, um, uh, if you're sitting still, uh, if you're not, you know, running around with with the device on, but if you have the device on and you're sitting still, um, all, nearly all the movements we've tracked in about 90 people now that we've, we've done imaging studies is mostly due to breathing, um, and you can actually track the motion of the spleen with accelerometry for 20 bucks, right? So uh, it actually works out well. Now, if they move, you know, you could turn off the device, but if you want to track it more while they're moving, or like the GI, then you're probably gonna have to move towards um, more sophisticated imaging, um, more to what GG can do. There's a company called Echo. They're using piezo, you know, PMUT technology to, to make a kind of more portable, wearable um, imaging side. So I, I think there's opportunities to integrate. Still costs are gonna be a bit higher, but uh, you know, I think there's opportunities to have wearable devices that can image at high resolution and stimulate while tracking these biomarkers that you're creating. So I think there's opportunities. I think the gut, the gut intestine probably is a little bit challenging, but the spleen, we're just fortunate that it's a, it's a large uh, organ that's moving uh, pretty consistently under breathing. As we have only one minute left, I was hoping that each of the speakers could share uh, their perspective on what would be transformative technologies for their domains in the coming five to 10 years. Uh, Todd, do you wanna start off? You're, you're doing the te technologies now, but what would also help you um, to accelerate your work? Well, you know, when I first began working on this, I started actually working on this before the microbiome revolution took off. I started working on this in 2011. And as I saw the bi microbiome revolution take off, I decided to just focus on the approach that we were developing and playing to my strengths. And as that matures, beginning to see the synergies. And we've seen, I mean, look, there's, Axial therapeutics now, I mean, the microbiome 
stuff has evolved so much that, you know, I, I know there are these mechanisms of how they're linked, which I sort of alluded to at the end of my, my very last slide. So one of the things I'm now intrigued about is beginning to envision taking very multimodal approaches uh, where you're, I don't know, measuring the microbiome, measuring a variety of different things combined with physiologic based approaches and identifying unique opportunities or two plus two equals five. So that's part of why, you know, I want to organize this workshop is to bring these different perspectives in. And hopefully that's something that we can all do together in the future. Sure, so I, I would echo that, uh, Todd, to you and grab a term from uh, Hubert. But uh, sorry for that bad pun. But um, I think um, for us in, in the space in which we operate, it's really, Look, we're really good at collecting samples and collecting data. Now, sequencing is getting very inexpensive. Metabolomics are inexpensive, and, and uh, metabolomics is becoming uh, much more comprehensive. Uh, it's really taking clinical metadata, metagenomics from the microbiome, metabolomics from, from different uh, tissue sources, uh, these all exist in silos today for the most part. It's really how do you bring those together and make those systems talk to each other? And we were talking a little bit about this. If we can get there, and it's going to be a lot of um, uh, algorithm development and so on to allow these different um, data sets to be integrated into being able to predict who's a likely candidate for a particular drug or who's at risk for a certain uh, problem, and what's their likelihood to respond? I think that that to me would be transformative for, for the industry. Thank you, Stuart. Hubert. I could save us time and just say I double echo and then we could end there. <laughs> but, but but really, I, I mean, I, I totally agree with that. And, and the other piece of it is um, there's a lot of technologists, uh, you know, I'm interested in technology. I, I know Todd is as well. But uh, there's so many things being developed now to non-invasively or minimally invasive modulate the nervous system, cells in the body. Uh, the biggest challenge, uh, to, to be honest, the neuromodulation field is kind of still a little bit like the wild, wild west, right? Because we don't know what we're actually modulating sometimes and if we don't have those biomarkers. But I think the biomarkers are too simple. And what you're saying, uh, Stuart and, and Todd, is like having a comprehensive view of what's going on and not treating you know each disease or each patient you know as one from the same sample right so i think that definitely yeah I, I, on both ends right therapeutic modulation side but also on the um, sensing uh, biomarker side thank you and again uh, thank you hubert and stuart and, and todd who is also the co-organizer of this meeting uh, and we'll then conclude on that note and go on to the next session thank you i just wanted to say I just wanted to say one one thing since Hubert and I are here, and that's uh, go blue. Michigan, second consecutive victory against Ohio State. Big smiles to Kavita. <laughs> I thought you were going to have a slide on it, Todd, uh, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, we're going to jump right into the last panel session. Um, I have the honor of um, trying to synthesize everything we've done over the last two days. Um, my name is June Axup. I'm from E11 Bio, where we're a nonprofit doing um, building new tools for brain circuit mapping. And as we have learned over these last two days, uh, there is a huge synergistic interplay between our microbial um, ecosystems just as much as there is a similar interplay between all the different players in fostering innovation in the space. So uh, we talked a lot about 
interdisciplinary collaboration from people from different disciplines, uh, building the need for research tools such as next generation sequencing and um, mouse models in order to create the amazing scientific dis discoveries that many of our panelists have um, discussed today. Uh, then that translates into drug discovery, into medical devices, and of course, bringing in clinicians to take that all the way through the uh, uh, clinical trials, and then coming in, of course, put, uh, sending all that package to the FDA for approval to finally get it into the hands of patients. So we can see that there's many, many people involved in this process in order to take uh, some of these discoveries and bring it to the world. Uh, so today, uh, for this last session, we're going to talk a little bit about this innovation ecosystem uh, and then also envision what we need to advance this field. So um, we have one speaker first before we get into panels, and um, this is uh, William Bumvillian, who is a lecturer at MIT and the Senior Director of Special Projects at MIT's Office of Digital Learning, where he leads research projects on workforce education. For over a decade, he previously was director of MIT's Washington office, supporting MIT's longstanding role in science policy at the national level. He has done a tremendous amount of work in bridging government policy, advancing manufacturing innovations and education, and has written many books on these topics, including innovation models like DARPA. Uh, so we will hear from him about the history and lessons learned from these different models of innovation, um, and uh, building an innovation ecosystem. June, thanks. Um, I just want to talk briefly about, you know, a few developments in the innovation ecosystem that affect some of the, some of the things we've been talking about uh, yesterday and today. And I'm going to need some help in moving my slides. Don't, there we go. Um, so I want to make kind of three points in my little 10 minute summary here. One is uh, a little bit of background and convergence and what we're trying to do in that territory, kind of what it's about from a big picture point of view. Then look for the some of the possibilities regarding convergence that come out of the proposed ARPA Health, which is now being implemented. And also some lessons, third point, some lessons from Operation Warp Speed. So quickly, just background and convergence, and as, as the folks in this room know, that term can be applied to the kind of interdisciplinary approaches that we've been talking about for the last couple of days. Um, arguably, it's the third kind of dramatic interdisciplinary uh, revolution that's that's been going on. Arguably, molecular biology brought to us by physicists like Max Delbruck and Salvador Luria uh, really brought physics into biology and really enabled molecular biology, that would be a first revolution. A second revolution would be around genomics. Um, again, very interdisciplinary. You know, David Gallus, as many of you know, really understood supercomputing at the Department of Energy and brought that in to the possibility of, of genome sequencing. Uh, the Genome Project began under Watson and then Collins. Um, Lee Hood, Craig Venter developed computerized synthesizing. Then the biotech revolution came along. Genetech was the first biotech around, built around genetic engineering. Um, the Human Genome Project uh, took off and se with corresponding sequences, sequencing efforts. Uh, so we've got very high throughput genome sequencing really in hours and minutes now, as opposed to years at dramatically lowered cost. Uh, the molecular, the, the second revolution genomics really was still built around a biological model with computer science really as kind of a tool set. But I'd argue, and, and, and these are some of the leaders from some of those revolutions, Delbrook and Lurie on the left and Lee, Leroy Hood and Venter, um, at Human Genome Project, Lander, Susan Hockfield, who's now written about a lot of this. Um, but the third revolution really is a combination of revolutions one and two. We're taking the methods and knowledge bases of those, incorporating a systems biology approach and adding a kind of new engineering design model and tool set 
plus integrating the physical sciences in this third revolution. So we bring in engineers and physical scientists, not only for devices, but really for the design of technology. So we're combining a biological model of complex, dynamic, interactive systems, you know, the traditional biological approach, merging that with engineering design, the kind of prioritization and targeting of design that you can do in engineering. Uh, with a merger of these talent bases from biology, engineering, and physical sciences. Uh, so whole new fields are developed here, synthetic biology, nanobio, systems biology, bioinformatics, computational biology, tissue engineering, regenerative medicine, AI now. All these fields are inherently convergence fields. Uh, so... You know, just to summarize briefly, we've got a history of other bio biomedical revolutions that are interdisciplinary at heart, molecular biology and genomics. And they have essentially built new knowledge bases. But convergence, what are we trying to do? It could be different. So we get a new knowledge base, plus a whole new suite of tools, plus new therapies. And that's what makes this, I think, particularly interesting. And the new tools, of course, include many of the things we've been talking about today, but imaging sensors, uh, nanoscale work, simulation modeling, big data, analytics, and so on. Um, so this convergence possibility, um, you know, can be accelerated, and one, but it faces a whole series of barriers. An underlying issue is that NIH really is still organized around biology. It's still hard to consider engineering and physical science approaches uh, in the context of biology within NIH, peer review is difficult there. It's difficult for NIH to get engineering and physical science reviewers to understand these kind of multidisciplinary research proposals. And as we know, peer review itself has limits on its ability to select high-risk, high-reward research. Uh, there's no common language across these fields. We, in effect, kind of need a new kind of convergence creole when we start pouring in physical scientists and engineers into the life science benches. Uh, we don't have common interdisciplinary training. How do biologists learn these new tool sets? Uh, so we still have stovepiped agencies. Interestingly, the Obama administration forced a series of really convergence collaborations. Um, NIH had been reluctant, and at NIH, the bioengineering site is quite small. NCATS didn't really scale. Uh, so that administration really pushed the brain initiative, precision medicine, cancer moonshot, all, were, all of which were organized around a convergence model and were interdisciplinary and uh, cross-agency as well. So there are barriers here that remain. Uh, ARPA-H potentially represents a new mechanism that could be an enabler for convergence research. And ARPA-H is being built, I think, in significant part on what DARPA was able to do. Is, as everybody in this space knows, uh, DARPA created its Biological Technologies Office back in 2013, although it had a long history of biology-related work prior to that. Uh, and that really helped foster the entry of engineering into biology. That was the approach DARPA fundamentally took. You know, our progress in mRNA vaccines a decade ago, uh, you know, DARPA jumped in a decade ago into mRNA at a time when NIH wasn't. Uh, and it's funding to Moderna and other early researchers in the early days really helped uh, advance those technologies to a point where they could be picked up when the pandemic hit. Their DARPA's goal was new vaccines within 60 days, and it saw mRNA as a tool to do that. Uh, and that really laid some important foundations for our rapid COVID vaccine development in 2021. So the ARPA model is inherently a high risk, high reward approach. It's not peer review, it's strong program manager. Can ARPA-H, which is going to pick up that DARPA model, hopefully, further convergence, uh, further the whole convergence movement in the way, in an expansion of the ways that DARPA had? So there's challenges that ARPA-H faces, uh, which we need to reckon with as we start to build it. Scale up um, is going to be a challenge. 
an ARPA can take a technology only so far, but how does it scale? Obviously, venture capital wants established pathways. Um, DARPA has the advantage of being a connected model. It works within the Defense Department, uh, within procurement agencies. How's ARPA-H going to make those connect, kind of connections? Uh, Island Bridge, another issue. Uh, you know, an ARPA entity needs a certain amount of protection from bureaucracy, but it also needs connection to decision makers who can further the scale up of technologies that are evolving from it. So who's going to, how's that scale up going to work? What's the role of the NIH director? What's the role of the HHS secretary? Um, we need to form hybrid models here. We're going to need biotechs along with academics in kind of a portfolio approach. And building that is going to be a challenge. Uh, and then overall, the culture of a new organization locks in very early. And you really have to get that early culture just right for it to work. So these are all some challenges our health faces, but it potentially could take on a major role in convergence. Um, and then to close, there's some lessons from Operation Warp Speed that, that may help us in these convergence approaches as well. So obviously, Operation Warp Speed worked on technology to vaccine within, a, within an eight-month period. It was a completely unique acceleration, as we all know. Uh, there were a set of tools that evolved in warp speed. Could we apply these to other health science challenges, including this, in this convergent space? Uh, what were some of the approaches that warp speed used? So it picked winners. Operation Warp Speed picked two leading companies in a series of four vaccine platform technology areas. Uh, it issued, and, and that's a risky process, right? Although the speed that it enabled turned out to be crucial. There's only so many approaches you can back if you want to scale up. And warp speed uh, had to limit the field for what it was going to be able to do. Its critical tool was guaranteed contracts. Uh, in effect, if you came up with a viable approach, the government would guarantee a contract to purchase uh, your vaccine. Uh, and that enabled parallel beginning and production at the same time vaccines were being developed. So you, you double track those two fundamental steps rather than having it undertaken in sequence. And that was enabled by this guaranteed contract approach. Uh, technology certification. So obviously, Warp Speed used FDA's emergency use approval. And the advantage of an FDA certification that something works is that it enables immediate market entry. That's a big advantage the life science field has over physical science fields. There's no comparable technology certification effort uh, that's available on the kind of hard tech physical science world. Um, the FDA rule, I mean, everybody hates FDA, but we also love FDA because that, that approval assures markets and assures scale up. So how do we get that tool applied in a convergence space, which merges physical sciences uh, with life sciences? Flexible contracting, extensive use of the Defense Production Act, which enabled uh, real supply chain scale up quickly for emergency needs. Also use of other transactions authority, uh, which enabled fast contracting outside of normal procurement. Operation Warp Speed mapped supply chains uh, and really understood supply chains and how to scale them. Um, it supported production scale up at factories. Uh, it wasn't just arm's length, it was deeply involved in the actual production process. Federal personnel were integrated into companies to speed regulatory compliance. The regulations were not sacrificed. There was no less safety, but the integration of personnel real in, into firms really enabled the speed up. Uh, and then obviously a national distribution effort, which Warp Speed undertook uh, to states and localities uh, turned out to be you know, quite important as well. The, the actual supply and distribution was, was pretty miraculous. So could some of these approaches, not necessarily all, but some of these, maybe particularly the guaranteed contract idea, 
which is the government will guarantee a contract if you come up with a solution, right? Uh, that, I think these are potential tools that could help enable the speed up of some of these convergence-based approaches. Thank you. So let's let's turn to some discussion. Thank you so much, Bill. Uh, I'd like to welcome back uh, our panelists. Um, Mauro is on the line um, from Altos Labs, who spoke yesterday. Uh, Hubert Lim here from University of Minnesota, and uh, Melody Zane uh, from Cornell University, our panelists. Um, yeah, I think Operation Warp Speed was just amazing um, in how fast we can move when collaboration can come together. And I think one element of why that happened is because of the urgency. Obviously, everyone was impacted by COVID, um, and then the the dire focus where multiple people, multiple industries, I would say globally, most industries um, had this push towards trying to fix this problem. And I guess one question, Bill, is what do you think? Um, how do we translate this when when there are so many you know different diseases out there right Every, everyone is very rooting for their own disease how can we um, provide enough resources get enough attention from people to to focus their energies for this kind of collaboration sure i mean obviously warp speed had the advantage that we were relatively close to actual vaccines in a series of platform areas um, so that's one differentiator. If you want to apply some warp speed tools, you've really got to be in range of implementation. So that weeds out a lot of approaches. But on the other hand, this guaranteed contracts element behind warp speed, and this is BARDA authority that it was that it was applying, and BARDA's had this authority for some time, you know, could be interesting. And, and one of the reasons why I like it is, you know, when the defense, when when the government contracts for a defense technology or a space technology, you know, they'll contract to for all of the costs and expenses of developing, you know, the technology, right? Maybe it's a new rocket for NASA, right? They'll contract for the entire cost, right? And bear that cost all during the development side. For a new aircraft, that's what they do. Guarantee contracts, that's a different kind of approach. Um, that says the government pays if you've got a solution. In other words, if you come up with an approved FDA approved drug, then we will guarantee a purchase of that technology, right? The government doesn't have to bear the development risks, but it, it only buys you know, something once the approval process is in place. So it's potentially a much more efficient and manageable process for the government rather than a, the com kind of complex burden of you know, detailed contracting that things like the Defense Department or NASA have to go through. It gets out of all of that. And yet it fits a venture capital model fairly neatly because venture capital is used to taking those kinds of risks. We're used to taking those kinds of risks in the way in which we develop medical products. But the guaranteed contract piece enables you to kind of speed up the process because you've got a guaranteed buyer, in effect, a guaranteed marketplace uh, at the end of the day. So I think that tool has some broader applicability. Um, you know, again, you've got to make a selection based on, you know, what's within range. But the, the analysts, the economic analysts who have looked at Operation Warp Speed have concluded that there was a savings of at least a trillion dollars to the federal government by in effect reducing deaths in the United States by from by 3 million right and, you, and they translate that into at least a trillion dollars of savings of the healthcare costs the government would otherwise have to assume and other economic costs it would have to assume so there are potentially huge savings to the government um, by creating a healthier population because the government bears so much of those health costs so I think there there may be ways to, to kind of apply some of those lessons um, to some really key emerging technologies that could have a big impact on societal health. That's super interesting. And yeah, that definitely changes the incentives for even VC backable companies. Um, uh, awesome. Um, 
I have a question for each of the panelists, because uh, each of you are chosen to be on this panel to, uh, because you guys have various types of collaborations um, that you do. And uh, so Mauro, as we know, um, you are at Altos, which is a very you know, new kind of way of collaborating scientifically. Um, Hubert, your work as you translated with industry now, um, working with Second Wave. Um, and then Melody, you yourself have multiple disciplines within your within your um, lab. Uh, can you each talk a little bit about uh, the benefits of collaboration in your structures and, uh, and then challenges that you want to um, work on? Oh, sorry, we're st we'll start with Moro. Yeah. <clears throat> so we are, we are very new. We are trying to establish this, this new model. Um, and the only way that we will be able to answer that question is with facts. Uh, so all of us, or many of us, we were in academia and, and we decided to take that, that opportunity to essentially try to answer questions that they, they are, they are very difficult to answer and and answer them in a way that we hope is the right way you know we you know bill was discussing about the nih funding and the system and sometimes you are precluded because you know you need to you have a five years term and then you need to send your papers and 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 so on and and really um, deeply think about 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 the process now uh, almost you know 8 months in the company I have to say that it's, you know, we all come with this uh, mental setting and our brain is worried in a way uh, that uh, we are uh, rewarded based on individual accolades. This is how all of us, we grow up. And we discussed with some of the people during dinner yesterday about this. Uh, and the goal is to leave all that aside. Uh, and the, the goal is to essentially, again, try to answer questions together we are discussing the possibility of publishing papers without names or which is a list of names or of random or 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 so on and and make the discovery to stand up but not the individual of course discoveries are made by individuals right but uh, i think if the focus is more on on the discovery uh, uh i think we believe uh, that we have a better chance to highlight, which is which is relevant. But again, um, if you ask me in ten years or in five years, I, I can let you know whether this is actually the uh, the right model. Now, the other point is, we want to take the best of academia, the best of industry, in much you know, uh, and and this is a constant, uh, essentially battle. Of what is the best? Um, but as I said, you know, this is a bi the biggest experiment in my life. Uh, I hope that it turns out well because this cre can create a different a, a different model, uh, which is not might not be better than Genentech or might not be better than NIH or Howard Hughes. It, it, it might be a different alternative that other people may might take. I agree. We should experiment with more models in order to find out. Um, Hubert. Um, yeah, so I have a few thoughts. Um, uh, well, thank you for your talk. Um, it was a nice summary and, and kind of uh, putting in that form, so I'll watch it again. Um, you know, one thing I found interesting about Operation Warp Speed, uh, you had pointed out some other items, um, was two things uh, on the more clinical side, the hu human uh, uh, patient side. You know, th there was a lot of people who, you know, because of the urgency, were volunteering for, um, you know, being involved with these clinical trials. Uh, some more, I would say, higher risk. There wasn't any corners cut, you know, but uh, I have to imagine on the ethics side, uh, through review of these, there was probably a, a different benefit to risk assessment because of the urgency of uh, COVID pandemic uh, and enable things to move more smoothly forward. Um, and it's not to say we, we reduce, um, you know, the importance of safety, um, but when you think of a lot of these um, health disorders, um, you know, the numbers are staggering. When you think about COVID pandemic, that was scary, but a lot of health conditions are, are scary too, and the numbers are quite high. But when you know you look at local ethics, and, and, and it's no criticism or anything like that, it's just it's hard to really um, um, weigh the benefits to risk from a, a much larger 
bigger perspective of society and the risks and, and the things like you like happened with the pandemic. So, so I think there's some efforts there too to kind of help restructure our clinical trial system away from a liability model to an actual patient safety centric model. Uh, and I think that could speed things along. So I, I thought that that was kind of interesting with operation with, you know, Operation More Sweet and Vaccine. The other point, uh, which I think is interesting that we should all consider is, uh, I think it was great that they pushed forward, you know, those specific, um, like you said, to, to, to you know, the, pick the winners. Um, but, but one of the lessons I feel with, with uh, the pandemic was also the therapeutics. You know, we were on the therapeutic side. We were trying to raise money from the government to push. And, and I feel, um, you know, I don't, uh, maybe because of um, being further away from that, uh, you know, the amount of money, I, I, you know, I don't know the numbers, um, but, you know, it, uh, it seemed to me that there was a, a less funds and probably because of less unknowns on the therapeutic side. And with the vaccines, the challenge has always been the variants. Um, and so when you think about, you know, kind of uh, the success on a long term, you know, therapeutics, uh, came, you know, becomes, so it's kind of like, how do you determine what is the, um, the, the winners to select or the, where to invest the money if you're going to go more aggressively through. So that, that's always a challenge that we'd have to work out. Um, so those are my two thoughts there on, on that. Um, the only other thing I would say is what you're saying, Amaro, is I agree. Um, it, it's, it was refreshing to come out of academia and do these company things. So I'm involved with two startup companies now. Um, it was always about accolades and grants and R1s and kind of achievements. Um, when you get out to industry, I mean, you've got investors, you've got milestones. I mean, it's kind of like growing up. I'm not to say I'm not grown up in academia, but academia sometimes can be a little bit comfortable. Uh, not, not for getting grants, that's always tough. But, um, you know, you, you, you realize very quickly that there are um, things that you have to achieve. You have to demonstrate, you know, at a very timely manner. Um, and, and that was helpful for me to really kind of wake up and see that you got to move and you got to think practically in what you're going to be doing. And there's a lot of factors involved. Uh, so I think it's it, it, it's healthy to get away from the accolades. I agree with you, Mara, and basically kind of pushing that. So yeah, I echo a lot of what was said earlier. Right. I just want to just add to this and uh, and specifically what drove me is I was at a point in my career that, um, you know, if you think about big discoveries, right? I mean, discoveries that will last, let's say, you know, a couple of generations, a couple of generations. In reality, there is very few of those, right? And 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 there is the factor of being incredibly talented, but also incredibly lucky to do some of those discoveries. Uh, on the other hand, I think we are in in this incredible time where we can really accelerate the movement from, you know, from the bench uh, to the clinic. Um, and, and this is what Altos offer to me, offer the possibility to go for the big discoveries, go for essentially to answer those big questions. But at the same time, you know, if we really understand, if we really understand the process, uh, have the possibility to develop to develop medicine. So, you know, it, not everyone will have made the jump not everyone made the jump and and I, you know by talking with all my colleagues all of them they have very different reasons uh but if you were to do that and you were to have an impact in medicine uh, and then bill can add in addition of genentech maybe in, in 10 15 years can add altos as a revolution in medicine uh, i think that would be incredibly important just to be part of it Well, uh, compared to other speakers, I think my labs are operating at a much smaller scale, just mostly in academia and collaborating with some other academic labs. Um, I think for for my stage right now, I just started my lab three years ago, so I, don't, I think it's really important that I establish my footing in um, uh, academia before I re really branch out and see if there might be industry partners that might be interested in taking our research to the next level. Um, I do feel that there are definitely barriers to establish that bridge to um, industry partners. For example, uh, recently we discovered some molecules from the gut bacteria that may moderate the coagulation response in uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection, and which was really interesting. We published the data and then I have no idea how to take it to the next step, basically. 
I definitely don't want all our work to end just in the form of publications. But I've talked to the technology transfer office, uh, office people at Wild Cornell Medicine. So they basically told me you need more data in order to convince industry partners to be interested in collaborating with you. And that requires funding. Um, so that's where we're stuck. Um, just my personal experience. And uh, in terms of the uh, multidisciplinary nature of gut microbiome research, for, on one hand, it's really exciting. On the other hand, it requires definitely things uh, really beyond what I can do in my lab. I trained as an immunologist, and now we're doing metabolic firing, and we're doing single cell RNA seq. We're doing um, a, 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 a spatial transcriptomics, and these are really challenging for someone like me as a uh, classically trained immunologist. So I am actually, for the most part, I think I'm doing a good job reaching out to a lot of collaborators, but it's definitely very challenging. Um, and I I think this platforms like today's uh, workshop is really, are really beneficial for, for me to get to know people that may have very complementary skill sets. You know, I was just talking to Surin Ram this morning. We're really excited to get to know each other and we'll talk more after today's workshop because we definitely have very com complementary skill sets that uh, potentially would be beneficial for both of our labs moving forward with our project. Yeah, definitely getting people in the same room. It's very yeah. important. Uh, so we have several questions queued up. Um, Andrew? Yeah, thanks. Um, I think my question follows on quite nicely, perhaps with this the, the the theme of collaboration and Melody, your comments right at the end there are kind of of your own kind of academic journey, and I reflect a lot of, on on my own as well. And I'm curious to kind of challenge our, our panelists. Um, we we heard a, a handful of our speakers over the last day or two kind of share their own journey of of kind of how they they reached this this um, this research and the in the very multidisciplinary nature of it. And I'm curious to ask um, the, the question, um, in thinking of how we currently progress through our, our traditional academic and scientific um, training and, and education pathways, that it is very rote and kind of systematic, even thinking all the way back to high school, where you have one year of biology and then a year of chemistry and then a year of physics, and then um, you, you go down a, a kind of deeper and deeper um, area of, of expertise and specialization. Does any panelists have kind of comments or thoughts around how we might re envision those traditional systems to help enable not just this collaboration, but also this multidisciplinary learner learning earlier um, to help facilitate this research moving forward faster? Oh, good. I mean, I can just add a few thoughts, Andrew. I mean, obviously, there is a great barrier to these deep interdisciplinary approaches, these convergence kind of approaches, because you know we're educated within stovepipes, right? We're educated within disciplinary stovepipes, and across the disciplines means learning a whole new set of tools and learning a new language, and. We really need to develop to further these inter interdisciplinary approaches, a training system by which, sure, take your deep dive in your discipline. And that's probably very important, but we've got to create these T-shaped learners that are able to cut across disciplines as well. And really within schools, trying to develop an exchange process by which you can pick up, you know, rudiments and basics and the lingo of these different fields. Uh, someone said that we really need a, a convergence creole to enable these interdisciplinary kind of discussions. And to some extent that's necessary and that's gonna come out, I think, if schools and departments can collaborate on some real cross-disciplinary training to make sure that graduate students and particularly younger researchers are picking up tool sets from other fields so that they can understand how to advance their territory by taking pieces from others. Yeah, I'll add to that. Um, you know, I, I'm in uh, the Department of Biomedical Engineering and um, we, you know, we do our best to cover a lot of topics in, in, one, in one department. 
Um, and you know, you, you tar start to see kind of different shades of that. If you go too extreme, then you have people who know a little bit uh, about everything, um, and, and it causes uh, some challenges there. If you go to the other side where it's too siloed, then you're very specific, but almost too rigid, maybe too trained in a rigid way to easily you know, navigate. So I like your T comment because you do need those specialties, right? You do need those people who could get into the, just the ultimate uh, specialty and understand that. Um, and then you need some individuals that can kind of see across fields, uh, but ultimately, for, even for those who are very specific, there's just gotta be a culture created where you know they're just reminded each way along the way, still learning in a specialty, but being nudged to kind of open up and try different things, but don't lose their specialty. And then when it comes up to be a faculty member or a team, you know, then you bring these people together. But as long as the culture's there and the incentives are there to do that, I think then you can you can build around it. I think the problem with industry um, with academia right now is incentives are uh, you know it's not aligned with team science. I mean you, they keep saying team science. But you know, like you said, right now for your you know career, if you go do that, you know you got to fund your lab, you got to get you know grants, you got to get your publications. These are the metrics. How do you define a team science metric? You know, it's a tough one. Uh, how do you define a commercialization metric that you're actually helping get something out there, or even a clinical translation metric? These are you know, is it thirty? thousand pages of FDA documents that you wrote and then you get promotion 50% of your promotion based on that I mean it's not in there I, I know because I try to put my FDA documents in there but you know it, these are things that um, I think we have to work out if we're going to converge more on the team science you know uh, direction any other additional comments otherwise we can move on okay cool Elliot yeah, Elliot Chekhov, I just want to thank all the speakers this afternoon and our moderator for really uh, fantastic presentations. And Bill, I really want to thank you again for stepping in on relatively short notice for really giving a brilliant presentation. Uh, it's fantastic. I have two questions. I think maybe one is for all the speakers and one probably a little bit more directed towards Bill. You know, one is, again, for all the speakers who really straddled academia and industry you've thought about it or living in it right now. Um, do we have a real gap in this science of scale up, you know, both in terms of our educational systems, which really aren't focused on that, and really in the funding mechanisms that aren't focused on that. It, it's really sort of left, um, you know, to, um, to the companies to step in that breach, but it is a substantial uh, science and uh, a lot of work and a lot of failures can go into that. So that's one uh, one basic question. I think the the other question, um, perhaps to Bill, is there's certainly nothing like a guaranteed market <laughs> that would spur industry uh, to make a lot of investments. But do you think we have the right checks and balances to avoid a command economy uh, and and uh, you know avoid um, sort of producing more yugos or ladas? you know, that uh, really don't sort of fulfill the need uh, that we really want to achieve. So perhaps maybe uh, start with the first question about uh, this sort of, you know, uh, chasm of death, which is often related to the challenge of uh, scalability. Yeah, Hubert. Uh, I have a lot to say, obviously, uh, those things. Uh, so maybe I'll, I'll start. Um, I, I do want to give credit to uh, NIH and, and DARPA and DOD. Um, you know, I, they really did see this gap, uh, DARPA especially. So when they started, you know, Doug Weber, uh, Justin Sanchez, in, in the neurospace at least, um, and Eric Van Giesen and individuals, um, you know, that, that B2 office was realizing this gap um, where, you know, you've got to do the science. But then, you know, you're not going to easily get investors until you get past enough data and some kind of prototype or technology. So that ultrasound project I showed you with second wave, um, that's actually because of DARPA. They, they took that high risk gamble on, you know, using ultrasound to modulate. Um, but you need to get clinical data. You need to build a prototype. Those are all funds, funds provided by DARPA uh, to get us through. So now we're at a stage where we can go to investors and they created that pathway. So, you know, that, that's an example where I, I think the funding agencies are seeing this, at least in the neurotech space. I don't know about the other, because I'm more in the neurotech. 
Uh, but even NIH, you know, we, we have this other grant, um, uh, this U mechanism where they, uh, you know, brain implants are, are difficult to translate. And they have this, um, this program where, you know, it's not a million dollars, you know, the grant I have is $10 million they invested in, in a single project. Uh, and, and they're willing to push that forward. And that project is bringing partners together. It, it was large enough that the companies were willing to pair up and they could see that we can actually get it through the preclinical regulatory you know, process and run a pilot study. And they broke it up into two stages to de-risk it for them, where they have a UG3 phase, which is a preclinical get it to where it's the study and then a UH3 phase. So they had some kind of creative ways to do this, to de-risk it for themselves, but also enable us to kind of push it to the level where after the study is over, investors could come in. So I, whoever, you know, all the people at NIH give them credit for kind of thinking of these creative ways. So I think they are working hard at that, but still with that said, there's still a lot to, cause you know, even when you get out of that, we're still running into some of these gaps that are dictated by, uh, you know, ultimately business model which some of these factors, you know, unfortunately, conditions that we know need to be targeted aren't really coming to the top because of the return that's you know, available for the investors. So that part, somehow, I don't know how we fix that, but Kevin, Kevin was getting to that, you know, yesterday. Mauro, do you have any thoughts now that you're in the middle of industry? So before I joined Altos, I had a, a big grant, a $7 million grant, um, from Welcome, Welcome Trust, this Welcome Leap program, uh, which is actually a very interesting one. I'm sure Bill is, is aware of it. Um, the review process is incredibly fast. Uh, they were looking for transformative, I think it's you know, similar to DARPA, right? Um, um, the, re the review process is extremely fast. They were looking for innovative ideas. Um, uh, the grants are given uh so you know very good amount of resources they are given for three years um there is a constant reporting system you know it's like every two three months you know they call okay what is about the data what about the data right so the, which this is a disadvantage because uh eventually we hope that we can predict the outcome in three months or in six months and i will have prefer much more just to let me alone and i will let you know when i have something right um, so the, the, I think that there are there are models where uh, you know we have the very traditional model from NIH, but we have models like DARPA and Welcome Leap and so on that uh, that they are providing sort of a fresh air and and the possibility to advance uh, science. But unfortunately, all of them are all all short leaf, and and if we are truly looking for that for that you know, revolution, instead of having an aspirin for the brain, if we are looking for the Viagra from the brain, invariably we need a long, you know, a more long lasting system of, of funding. Uh, the, we discussed, you and I, Elliot, uh, uh, what about the Bell Labs of biology? We have the Bell Labs that, you know, can we do a system that now we can really push truly, truly in, innovation uh, and and I think, you know, NIH and other funding agencies, maybe this is about time to sort of revisit the model where we are uh, at uh, and compare it to, you know, industry and and how can essentially we can accelerate uh, progress. Bill, any lessons learned from the world of manufacturing uh, for the world of biology? Oh, you're on mute, I think. Right. So, you know, Moral, I'm glad you raised Welcome Leap because, you know, as you know, it's led by two, a former director of DARPA and a deputy director of DARPA, Regina Dugan and Ken Gabriel. And they have very purposely attempted to apply a DARPA model there with essentially a, a very DARPA-like approach. And... You know, I think an ARPA Health, as well as DARPA's own Biological Technologies Office, as well as Welcome Leap and a handful of other comparable kind of organizations, they can really play a role, getting to your question, Elliot, in helping manage this kind of scale-up kind of problem. Um, and something which those organizations do, they create communities of thinkers, right? 
So it's not just a program manager. The program manager is very much influenced by a community that a DARPA-like organization, an ARPA-like organization helps build. And it tries to bring in the very best ideas. The program manager in the end makes the decision on whether to fund a particular project, but it, it is a very collaborative thinking community kind of effort. And that thinking community provides a certain amount of discipline to avoiding pick, picking the lattas, Elliot. Um, you, you really have a certain amount of, I wouldn't say consensus building because you've got strong program managers, but you definitely have an idea space where ideas are being generated and shared that create a certain kind of discipline in the selection process. Um, and then there is a, in effect, a technology road mapping effort that goes into this. Right. So when when DARPA or an ARPA like entity decides to pick a technology for support and movement towards scale up, there is a technology road mapping effort that accompanies that that also puts some certain amount of discipline in the process. Now, look, overall, on the scale up side, the life science world is in much better shape uh, than the physics, sci physical science world. And that's because venture capital using the FDA approval and the FDA phases of approval, that enables them to do benchmarking and risk management at three different levels. So venture capital is willing to put money in in a series of tranches into a life science technology for a 10 or 15 year process. On the physical science side, with no such technology certification or benchmarking, you know, you're lucky to get a venture capital firm that's willing to take a risk of a technology that's two years away from actual implementation and production. So there's a lot of positive things going on, on the life science side. In the end, yes, there is definitely a scale up problem. It's not nearly as severe, I don't think, as in the physical science side, like in the manufacturing scale up space, but it's still there. And a DARPA like entity. I think can help be an intermediary organization stretching between academic research, bringing in in a hybrid model companies, and then helping move on a technology development road mapping pathway towards an implementable technology, at least getting to that initial prototype. So that may be a tool set uh, that we're going to be able to use at more scale with the advent of ARPA age uh, than we've been able to do in the past. Very fascinating discussion. Uh, unfortunately, we are at time. And please uh, help me in thanking everyone on the panel. And with that, we turn it over to Elliot for closing remarks. Well, first, I'd like to thank uh, all of the speakers, uh, moderators, the participants in this two-day workshop. I'd like to thank all the members of the uh, planning committee uh, and for uh, Kavita Berger and Andrew uh, Bremer for, uh, is that a signal? <laughs> and uh, from Andrew uh, for their leadership. Um, uh, we were recalling that uh, you know, our first uh, really focused uh, meeting on this workshop uh, occurred on November 9th, so it was five weeks ago. And to be able to bring this together on such no short notice and have so many spectacular presentations really reflects an incredible commitment from all of our speakers and, uh, and participants. And certainly also want to thank all the members of the Standing Committee on Biotechnology and National Security Needs um for their um uh, commitment and support of this effort uh i guess just to close out uh, maybe it's a bit of a verbal word cloud uh, of many of the themes that came through over this last two-day period um this um really important um increasing understanding of sensing and signaling and the be able uh, the ability to modulate uh, these pathways between the gut and the brain and the microbiota, um, the fundamental challenges of understanding mechanisms in order to optimize uh, therapeutic effects, uh, the real notion of, um, of the challenges of data integration uh, and the need for new tools and, um, and the ability to build bridges, which 
ultimately will be based upon data sciences and uh, likely machine learning and artificial intelligence to give us the convergence that we ultimately need. Um, I think we learned a lot about <laughs> the importance of food as medicine and microbes as food and that microbes are medicines. Uh, and all of this holds a tremendous amount of problems, a, a, a tremendous uh, amount of opportunities uh, for a variety of very debilitating uh, conditions for patients and families who are in need. Uh, we learned, especially during this last session, about the challenges of the marketplace and of crossing this last mile. Uh, but the potential mechanisms that are being established uh, that offer a tremendous amount of hope uh, for uh, accelerating these really exciting technologies at this important interface of uh, the gut, the brain, the immune system, and the microbial world in which we live. Um, again, uh, I think this is a really exciting area that's on a tipping point that clearly reflects decades of work uh, by a variety of leaders in the field who uh, toiled away in darkness, surrounded by a lot of skeptics, uh, who uh, probably looked at this field much as how many uh, in the community looked uh, two decades ago at gene therapies, at uh, how we looked 15 years ago at RNA medicines, uh, and, um, uh, and even just a decade ago, at cell-based therapies for oncology. Um, you know, it's always uh, a myth before it's a reality. And so I don't have any doubt that uh, a decade from now or potentially sooner, a lot of what we talked about today that um, we thought uh, is just a dream uh, and a notion uh, will really be having real world effects uh, in ways that um, may be difficult for us to believe at the moment. Uh, so again, thanks everybody for participating. I would like to turn the podium over to Andrew who would like to make a few uh, brief remarks as well. Thanks so much, Elliot, and I will be very, very brief. I just wanna acknowledge um, everyone again who was involved in uh, putting this together and first to all the speakers and participants for, for the really exciting discussions um, and exciting science. That, that, that is really taking place. Um, so uh, first, thanks to the uh, planning committee, as Elliot mentioned, um, and, and really want to give uh, quite a hand to Elliot in, in spearheading this effort as our, as our chair. I think um, sometimes I wonder if I should go back to medical school so I can spend more time uh, learning from you. Um, but I also want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Yasmin Belkate, who was not able to attend last minute this week, um, and, and all of her efforts, and, and are, we're grateful for her and her efforts of, uh, on the planning committee, along with others putting together this, this uh, workshop on, on relatively short notice. I also want to put, uh, uh, send out a, a great thanks to our standing committee, under which the, this workshop, under the auspices of which this workshop is being organized. Um, as you can see from the, the next slide, it is quite a breadth of uh, specialty and area of, of expertise. Um, very grateful for all of you and your input. And I think um, when our committee identified this uh, topic over the last two days as one that we should focus our efforts around a workshop, I think the discussions over the past two days really uh, showed just how much of uh, value a, a, a workshop around this topic would be. So um, thank you all so much on, on the work on the standing committee for um, all of your continued work. It's a, it's a really exciting group of, of folks to, to be able to interact with. Last but not least, um, I think Michael Fishbach used the word, um, some of the staff are, are gems, and I want to give such a shout out to all of my colleagues here at the National Ac Academies who have helped put this workshop on. Um, first and foremost, Kanya, who's, who's uh, virtual, who uh, spearheaded some efforts with the, the workshop planning committee, along with our, our fearless leader, Kavita Berger, um, as our board director on the board on life sciences, but just to name um, everyone, Crystal Saunders and Jess Moy, uh, who have been fundamental and critical to our work, along with Trisha Tukolsky um, and Nancy Connell. Um, I also want to acknowledge Stephen Moss, who is, is spending some dear time with his newborn, and we miss him dearly and are grateful that he's able to be with her. Um, and last but not least, Eric Edkin, who's been such a fundamental uh, uh, asset to us for, for help facilitating our new world of hybrid meetings. 
Um, last but not least, um, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, proceedings in brief will result from the discussion. So look forward to that in the early spring and uh, look forward for the announcement uh, when that comes out. Besides that, um, have a wonderful, wonderful weekend and a, a warmest holiday season to you all. And thank you all so much again for the, the active discussion. Thanks. Thank you.